Hello everyone. Welcome to another part of What If Decca Ran an Orphanage. If you enjoy the story, please like, subscribe, and share the video. It really helps me out. I did not write the story. The original writer is Kayadon. Please go support them. Now let us dive in. Kiba was once again, sitting in her room watching TV. At this point, she wasn't even really watching, just staring blankly at the screen. Roar. Suddenly Kiba heard the familiar sound of Kai screaming roar and felt her room slightly shake a bit. Kiba saw something outside her window from the corner of her eye and she quickly ran over to look at it. Outside was a fantastic battle between Kai, Achiko, Juken, and Nara. Juken was in his stink fly form, shooting gunk into Kai's eyes, while Nara froze his feet to the ground as Articuana and Achiko kept hitting him with a big tree that she had grabbed. But Kai was just powering through everything, thrashing about, trying to hit his opponents with his heads and feet. It didn't take long for her to remember her own battles with Kai and imagine herself fighting alongside them. Or even better, maybe she could be fighting alongside Kai against his attackers, leading him in battle. Kiba shut her eyes and shook her head, trying and failing to get that thought out of her head. No, I'd probably fall and crash through the house. I might even hurt someone. As quickly as the battle came, it left. With Kai flying away somewhere out of sight, with Ken picking up Achiko and Nara and flying after him. Once they were all gone, Kiba balled up her fist and held in a scream of frustration. She quickly ran over to her bed and screamed into her pillow. No matter how much she tried, she couldn't quell the feeling of wanting to go outside and join them. It looked like so much more fun than staying stuck up in here. I should just forget about it. Kiba told herself as she bruised herself in her bed. Not too much longer, Kiba heard something else outside her window. T-U-D-A. She heard another voice outside her window. Out of curiosity, Kiba once again brought herself to the window and saw Shiruku, Eri, and Kei. Eri was dressed in an apple red dress that was a bit fancier than anything she would normally wear, looking more like something that would fit Kiba's attire. She was clearly embarrassed about it as even from up there Kiba could see that Eri's face was about as red as her dress. Kei seemed far more ecstatic, looking down at her white, almost toga-like dress, seeming like something fitting of her mid like appearance while also seeming fitting and pretty. They both possessed the kind of regalness that Kiba loved in her clothes. She couldn't hear much of what they were saying, but they did seem to be having fun, although Eri might have been struggling a bit, even if she looked absolutely precious. Kiba's cheeks puffed up as she pouted. Couldn't they do this somewhere else? Didn't they know how badly she wanted to jump down there and dress up with them? Laugh with them. Hug Eri because she is flipping adorable. But she could tear apart the dress, which she often did, and she might accidentally do to Eri what she did to Fu on a constant basis, except Eri would actually get hurt. Suddenly Mina came out and started talking to them. Hey girls, let's go. We can try on even more cool clothes. Shiruku and Kei cheered and Eri nodded as they all ran away. Although Eri lagged behind before staring up at Kiba, with sad, begging eyes, as if asking why Kiba wasn't down there with them. Kiba felt like she got stabbed with that look so much so that she literally jumped back from her window and onto the floor. Ag who? Kiba wailed as she rolled around on the floor. Not fair, not fair, not fair. It was all just so unfair. Why did she have to be born with such an uncontrollable quirk? Why couldn't she ever turn it off like Achiko could with her strength quirk? Why did she have to drink blood to use it? Kiba once again grabbed her pillow and screamed into it. Hopefully, she could just ignore the world for the rest of the day. All right. Let's get the meat-eating competition underway. Kiba heard the loud voice of Mina Ishido outside her window once again. Meat-waiting competition. Oh, come on. Kiba screamed before shaking her head. No. Nope. I'm not gonna look. Our contestants are Yami, Juken, and Kirishima, shouted Mina, and our food cooked personally by our head chef Sato. Our lots of gyukushi beef skewers. Some beef tataki. Yakiniku. Loads of hamburg. And lastly, we have oodles of steak. All perfectly cooked and freshly made. Mmm. Kiba screamed into her pillow once more as it was all she could do to keep herself from drooling at the sounds of some of her favorite foods as well as new foods she really, really wanted to try. She'd just have to ask if she could have some later, very politely, and only a little. All right, begin. Mina shouted. Somehow, those boys managed to eat loud enough that Kiba could hear it all. The way. From her room. It would be impressive if it wasn't infuriating, as Kiba could hear just how much they enjoyed their food. It was hell. And it was hell that continued for almost half an hour. All right. And the winner is Juken. Although he did use his quirk to turn into a giant orange dog that wasn't against the rules, so he wins. Mina announced. Raph. 
roared Junken as wild mud. All right, with that done, let's eat all of the leftover food and get out of here. Mina shouted. MMGG che 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 che. Kiba whined. Just ignore them Kiba. Don't think about all that delicious food you're not eating. She'd just wait to be fed later at dinner time in four hours. The forest was lighting up. Kiba had absolutely no idea what was going on. All she saw was that there was a very bright glow in the forest of many different colors and she couldn't see what was causing it. And her curiosity was killing her. Kiba bit her lip and pried herself away from the window and back onto her bed, hoping that not looking at it would keep her from feeling tempted to explore what the heck was causing that. It did barely. Boom. Kiba blinked in disbelief as she heard something she couldn't believe. Kaboom. Fireworks. She could hear fireworks. Immediately Kiba once again returned to her window. And she did in fact see a firework part of one. Boom. A firework went off and Kiba could just barely see a small part of it. Kiba wanted to cry. In fact, she was actually tearing up from sadness and frustration. She hated being stuck in this stupid room. It was literal hell. How the hell did Fuku manage to live like this? She was very, very tempted to just say screw it and go outside to see the fireworks. Surely she could hold back her strength long enough to look at the fireworks. You selfish girl, shouted a voice in her mind that reminded her a bit too much like her mother for her comfort. Can't even stay in your room for a week, you leech. After everything he's done for you, that stopped any feeling of temptation she had and replaced it with sadness, guilt, and anger. So Kiba just went away from her window back onto her head, stuffed her face back into her pillow, and started crying, wondering just how many times she would have to repeat this over the course of her new life. Kiba wanted to sleep so much. It was now past midnight, and no matter how much she tried, she couldn't get a lick of sleep. She was too busy thinking back to all the things she had missed today. A huge fight with Kai, showing off some cool dresses, a meat-eating competition, whatever the heck that thing in the forest was, all ending off with a fireworks display at night. That all sounded like it would have been a great day. A fantastic day. And yet it had actually been one of her worst days ever since she had since she came here. Would this be what her future had in store? It was on that dreadful thought that she finally fell into a dreamless sleep. Kiba was woken up by someone shaking her. MMMM. Go away. Kiba still felt absolutely miserable and she did not feel like getting up and facing reality. Absolutely not. Said a familiar but not too familiar voice. Wait, Kiba was shocked when she recognized the voice and had to open her eyes to confirm what she was hearing. Fukunoko. In front of her was Fuku with her hoodie on but the hood was down and her face was revealed. That was the first most shocking thing about her situation. The second was that she was outside. In the woods. They were in a large clearing next to a small lake laying on the grass near the water. What the? How did I get out of here? Kiba panicked slightly once she realized she was out of her room. I took you here? Fuku shyly admitted, speaking just loud enough so Kiba could hear her. Ha! Huh. Why? Kiba was beyond confused. Sure, she knew people weren't exactly happy about her staying in her room, but Fuku of all people. Fuku did the exact same thing. And she was way too shy to do something like this. And yet, here they were. Was this a dream? Kiba pinched her cheek, confirming that she was in fact really here. I really can't believe you actually stayed inside the whole day. Fuku pouted at her. After everything we did to try and lure you out, I was sure you would leave. Wait. Kiba took in what Fuku just said with wide eyes. You all did that on purpose. Kiba's expression changed to that of pure fury. All the pain and misery she felt today was on purpose. Why? Kiba shouted, tears of rage leaking down her face. Why would you do that? Just to lure me out. You spend all your time in your room. But it's bad when I do it. Why won't you all just leave me alone? Why do you care? Because I know how it feels. Fuku shouted back, much to Kiba's shock. Fuku was also crying, but instead of running away or apologizing, she returned Kiba's furious look with a determination in her eyes that Kiba would have never expected. I know what it feels like to live that kind of life, and I hate it. I hate constantly being afraid to go outside and talk to people. I want to leave my room and have fun with my friends. Fuku took a moment to catch her breath after screaming out her thoughts while Kiba was just taken back. She'd never imagined Fuku would be so suddenly open with her. The last time she saw her face she'd ran away. And now she had her face out in the open to her and was yelling and expressing herself. What was even going on here? After catching her breath, Fuku continued speaking, a bit calmer this time. I've always been a big fan of your streams. At first, I just watched them because I wanted to know what was going on around the house. But pretty soon I actually just started to like watching your videos because of, well, you. 
why you were always so brash and unafraid, always doing new things and trying new things, and even willing to get hurt and just brush it off. It was, it felt like, like I was living through you. You always seemed so alive that it felt like I was living this amazing, exciting life right alongside you. When Ari and Kay were busy and I was stuck all alone in my room, I would watch your streams or your videos and I, I wouldn't feel alone. I was, I am a huge fan of yours. Even if, even if we haven't really met or talked much, I know you. And I love you. That statement smacked Kiba in the face. She was used to heaping praise upon herself or others playing along with her act or even Azuka's unrelenting and unending love. But this was genuine, heartfelt praise. From someone other than Azuku. And I'm not the only one. Fuku fumbled a bit as she pulled her phone out of her pocket. Take a look. Fuku held her phone up to Kiba's face. On it was a video from Kiba's channel, but it wasn't one that she made. Instead, Fu was shown, sitting very close to the camera, and the video was titled, We Need Your Help. Hi everyone. You may have noticed, but Kiba hasn't uploaded in a while, Fu said to the camera. Something bad happened. Dad collapsed from overwork. He's fine and he's recovering at home now but you've probably seen how much property damage Kiba causes and so Kiba started blaming herself for it. She thinks she's some sort of burden or parasite. None of us can reach her alone so we need your help to show Kiba just how much we appreciate her. Leave a comment showing your application and we'll put the best ones in a video to show Kiba. Please. If you're going to show your support, do it now. Otherwise, this may be the last video on this channel. The video stopped and immediately Fuku went on to the next video. This one is titled, Appreciation for Kiba and it started showing a slideshow of different comments. Kiba, as a father of five myself, I can say for certain that it was not your fault alone. The work that goes into raising children is a lot for any parent, let alone one raising that many children. And as a father myself, I can say for certain that it was worth it. Despite any difficulties he may have had with your wildness, I'm 100% sure that he was overjoyed at watching you having fun and living your life to the fullest. And as someone who just wants to watch children having fun and smiling while my own kids are leaving the nest, I beg you, please don't stop living your life. I don't think there is anyone else on this platform that makes videos anywhere near as lively as yours are. I'm going through a rough spot in my life right now and having something cute and lively to comfort me is really helping me get through it. Thank you for everything you've done for me and please don't stop being cute Lady Kiba. How on earth can you be a parasite if you give us all so much joy? These videos actually encouraged me to adopt a kid. Her name is Seo and she's five, coming up on six. And that was easily the best decision of my life. She's the light of my life now and while it may seem a bit presumptuous, I think I'm pretty important in her life too. She loves your videos and watching them together has become a part of our weekly routine. Thank you for everything you've done for us. And please don't stop smiling. I don't have many friends, so watching you all hanging out and having fun, it made me feel not so lonely anymore. Please keep on making videos. I beg you. My cork gives my claw hands. I caused a lot of problems for my parents as a kid. I get ripping up the furniture and accidentally scratching them. One time I tried wrapping up my hands. When I showed my parents, they looked horrified and immediately scolded me. They said that they'd take all the pain in the world if it meant making sure I was happy and that the scars they carried were proof of their love for me. I don't know caretaker as a person all that well, but I do know that he does love you all. And no good parent would be happy if their child isn't. Please don't give up Kiba. We love you Kiba. The messages went on and on, all showing Kiba heartfelt appreciation and love. Kiba didn't even realize when she started crying, she just couldn't look away from the video. She couldn't look away from the overwhelming support she was getting as her heart felt like it was going to burst. The comments eventually came to an end as did the video. Fuku put her phone back and looked at the now crying Kiba. People want you to keep going. To be happy. Because you make them happy. Izuku too. Everyone at the house agreed to help because they were worried about you. Please don't do what Izuku did and ignore everyone. Kiba hesitated a moment, sniffing as she spoke. But what about daddy? I don't want to cause trouble for him, but but my quirk dash. Fuku went over and grabbed her shoulders. It's okay. People aren't mad at you and you can improve. I know, it might be hard to believe that. Because, there's this little voice in your head that's scared and keeps giving you bad advice. But you need to ignore it. Because if you listen to that voice, you will be miserable and unhappy for the rest of your life. That way you felt today like you were missing out on life. Like everything is happening just outside your door or your window. That's how you'll feel for the rest of your life. I know how hard it can be, but I also know that it's so worth it for everyone's sake. 
Kiba just looked at her for a few moments before her sobbing got even worse as even more tears streamed down her eyes. H huh. Wait. Did I do this wrong? Fuku started to doubt herself. I'm off. Kiba wrapped her arms around her and hugged her tightly while sobbing into her hoodie. Hey. Hey. Kiba. I said no one was upset and that's true but please learn to restrain yourself a bit. Fuku groaned out quickly. It was a good thing that Kiba had not drunk much blood that day, otherwise this would be painful. Kiba lightened up her hug but kept sobbing just as hard. Fuku hesitantly wrapped her arms around Kiba and comforted her. Eventually, Kiba stopped crying and the two separated. T thanks. Kiba smiled at Fuku, causing Fuku to nervously smile back. I, I was being foolish. Thank you for helping me. I, it wasn't just me, everyone was willing to help, Fuku told her sheepishly. Kiba nodded. I better give them all an extravagant thank you when tomorrow, I'm just really shocked you'd do all this. It must have been hard. Fuku shyly smiled. Not as hard as you'd think. I'm normally so worried about what's going to happen to me, but this time, I was too worried about you to think about it. Kiba paused and then gave Fuku a heartfelt, touched smile. What a wonderful sister you are, I am truly blessed. Izuka couldn't sleep. He was so worried about Kiba. Even after all they'd done today, she still hadn't come out. And now everything rested on Fuku's shoulders. Because what could he do? He had used up his credibility with all the lies he told about his own health. It's almost funny because of his attempt to do everything himself, he now had to rely on others. However, before Izuku could get into the self-deprecating rabbit hole, there was a knock on his bedroom door. Daddy? Can I come in? Asked Kiba's voice on the other side of the door. Izuku's eyes widened in shock, but his brain quickly caught up and responded. Yes, yes. Come in. Almost immediately after he said that Kiba burst through the door and leaped onto his bed before cuddling into his arm. I'm so dumb. Kiba groaned, hiding her face in his arm. Today sucked and I did it all for nothing. Izuka paused for a moment before taking in what she said and realizing what had happened. The teen dad smiled down at her and started petting the top of her head. Good job, Fuku. It wasn't for nothing, Izuku told her. I'm glad you were thinking of others. You just overreacted. Kiba nodded and snuggled up closer to him. I know, from now on, I'll train even harder to hold back my strength. That's the spirit, Izuku told her. I'm just glad my little queen of eternal darkness is back to normal. Thanks, Daddy, Fuku said. Aren't you going to call me caretaker again, Izuku asked her. I'll do it tomorrow, Kiba muttered. I'm tired. Is it on? Kiba said as her audio came online and she appeared on the screen. We're on, Fu said from over at his computer. It was a bright and sunny day. Kiba was outside, standing in front of a wooden table with a huge array of meat dishes in front of her and Juken a few feet away with the same table and the same amount of meat dishes. And all the kids along with Class 1A and Izuku were behind the cameras watching the whole thing. Hello, my loyal minions. And rejoice. Kiba said, immediately getting into the swing of things. You all showed your faith in me. And I would be a terrible queen to not reward such heartfelt loyalty. I have not made one of these messages in quite some time, this of course needs to be immediately corrected. Which is what we are here to do today. For you see, yesterday there was a meat-eating contest which my rival Ken won. Naturally, Ken puffed out his chest arrogantly with a huge smirk on his face. But I was under a truly wicked spell that caused me to forget who I truly was and fall into despair. Kiba said dramatically. Fortunately, it was thanks to all of you as well as my siblings and the wonderful Fukunoko Dash. The cameras pointed up at Fukunoko's window and Fuku briefly gave a thumbs up before retreating back into her room. I have regained my sense of self, Kiba shouted. And as such, I cannot allow the results of that contest to go uncontested. So, without further ado dash, Ken brought up his watch and slammed down on it and in a green flash, he transformed into wild mud. Let us begin. Hooked. Now, Mineta knew he wasn't the best of influence. After all, if you asked anyone, himself included, how to describe him in one word, literally everyone would say, pervert. So being stuck in a building full of kids, not the best situation to be in. Because now, if he perved out in front of the kids, they would actually kill him. Not to mention he wouldn't get paid. Fortunately, he was held up in the office for the most part. Behind a desk, away from kids and away from the girls. Unfortunately, it was extremely boring work. Ugh. How did Midoriya do so much paperwork? Mineta threw his pen onto the desk, bringing his hands to his head so he could use his head balls as stress balls. After a few moments, Mineta calmed himself and looked around, seeing if anyone was watching him at the time. Once he confirmed that he was alone, he quickly took out his phone. 
He'd been working for a few hours, he deserved a bit of a break. At least long enough for him to catch up with his gotchas. Ah, gotcha games. Such bastions of fanservice and lu art. All incorporated into a game with gameplay no one really cared about as they spent their life savings away to simp for someone that wasn't real and was specifically designed to suck your hard-earned cash right out of your wallet. So of course these were Mineta's favorite type of game. Now Mineta didn't spend too much cash on these games, but if he had the funds to spend a ridiculous amount of money on these games, he would. Without question. As Mineta opened one of the games, he suddenly heard a voice from his right. What are you playing? H. Mineta screamed, jumped in his seat, his head turned to see Netsa standing next to him, looking up at his phone. When did you get here? Uh, not too long ago? Netsa shrugged. You were on your phone and didn't notice me. Whatcha playing? Ah uh, hi, it's a gotcha game. Mineta had to focus very hard. And make sure he didn't slip and say anything that would cause the girls and Izuku to murder him. A gotcha game? Netsu asked, looking at the phone. Yeah, it's a video game you can play on a phone or tablet where you can pull characters and use them to play I guess, Mineta answered. There are some where you can pull your favorite characters from your favorite anime or manga. Like Dragon Ball, One Piece, Pokemon, Flame Insignia. There are even some for characters from Marvel. And there's one game where you can pull real-life heroes called Strongest Heroes. And sometimes they have cool outfits. That sounds neat. Netsa looked excited. Can I try one? I mean, they're all technically free, so if you have a phone, sure, why not? Mineta hoped that this would get this kid away from him. What's the worst that could happen? Something is off, Izuka said as he laid in his bed and looked at his phone. What's up? Achiko asked as she was doing some cleaning around Izuku's room. The kid's phone usage. It's skyrocketing. Izuka said, looking at the kid's phone usage on his own phone. Izuku had gotten almost all of the kid's phones for self-explanatory reasons. However, many of them didn't use them all that often. This was for a multitude of reasons. Mostly because most of the kids preferred to go outside rather than play with a phone. But also because they didn't really leave the house so they always had access to a computer or TV which was almost always better to use than a phone. But right now, it seemed like the kids had been on their phones for most of the day. And it was pretty much all the kids. The only ones who had kept their normal phone usage were Koda, Otoko, Mu, Nara, and Yami. Kai technically also kept his normal phone usage, but he didn't have a phone, so that didn't really count. That's weird. These kids normally like to go outside more. Achiko pointed out with a frown. I know. Which is good, because playing outside with friends is much healthier than being on your phone constantly. Izuka said, slightly worried at these strange results. I wonder why Dash. And then suddenly he got his answer in the form of a payment request notification. Shiruku is requesting a 10,000 yen purchase on Genshin Impact. Oh no. Izuku's eyes widened as he started to see where this was going. And the continued notifications on his phone confirmed his suspicion. Netsu is requesting a 10,000 yen purchase on Dokken Battle. Kiba is requesting a 13,000 yen purchase on Dragalia Lost. K is requesting a 10,000 yen purchase on Pokemon Masters X. Sansen is requesting a 10,000 yen purchase on One Piece Bounty Rush. Eri is requesting a 1,000 yen purchase on Pokemon Masters X. Yanda is requesting 5,000 yen purchase on Pokemon Masters X. Kyoku is requesting a 8,000 yen purchase on Pokemon Masters X. Fu is requesting a 1,000 yen purchase on Dragalia Lost. Izuka then quickly looked at the records on the kid's phone and looked at the recently downloaded apps. Achiko, get everyone here. Immediately. After a few minutes, Achiko, along with Ida, Momo, and Inko had gathered all the kids but Nara, Yami, Otoko, Mu, Kai, and Koda, who were all now standing in his room. Fukunoko was even there, albeit hidden behind her hoodie and standing behind Kei. Eri and Fu already seemed to know what this was about and looked slightly ashamed. So, I've noticed from your phone usage and the payment request that you all got addicted to gacha games, Izuka said, looking from his bed, down upon all the children. We're not addicted. Kiba protested. Kiba, you downloaded 8 gachas and requested a total of 85,000 yen to spend on these games. Izuka deadpanned. Kiba cringed a bit before looking away. Okay, maybe I asked for a bit much. And you're not the only one. Shiruku, you downloaded 10 games and requested 95,000 yen to spend on them. Izuka continued rattling off the data. And Fuyu downloaded 12? Although you did only request 9,000 yen. Fu couldn't look Izuku in the eye. 
Me and Kyosi I really like the feeling when we get what we want in the games. I know it's a problem but I can't stop. I'm sorry daddy but they all just look so pretty. Shiruku apologized. You're not wrong, Fuku admitted bashfully. It's not that big of a problem, Ken said. We're rich, right? Yes, we have an abundance of money. Isuka sighed. But running this place also takes a large amount of money, so if there is an emergency, it's better we use the money on that than wasting it on games like these. Trust me, I play strongest heroes. It was problematic. He spent far too much money on that game. I almost had to get a second job just to keep us afloat. Inko sighed as she recalled Azuka's gotcha period. You can end up spending your entire life savings on these games and wasting all of your time on them, Izuku told the kids as he purposely ignored addressing what his mother just said. Which is why we're gonna establish some rules. Ah. Ken and Netsa groaned. Knowing they likely wouldn't like this. Firstly, you can only spend four hours a day on these games, Izuku told them. And remember, I see your phone usage, I will know if you go over that amount. Secondly, if you're going to spend money on these games, you can only spend your own money. Meaning that, now, you're all going to have to earn an allowance. Ha! Huh. The kids looked at him with a mix of shock and confusion. An allowance. You'll still be able to ask for things and I'll spend my own money on those. But if you want to ask for things like candy or money to spend on gacha games, you'll have to earn that money yourself. Izuku explained. I'll leave the ways you can do this up to your imagination. However, Shiruku, Fu, you both will already be getting an allowance, seeing as you both contribute to the house's income with your quirks. What? How is that fair? Ken objected. It's not, Izuka said. But this is to help prepare you for life. And as most of you are aware, life isn't fair. Especially when it comes to quirks. Shiruku and Fu both were born with abilities that allow them to naturally contribute to the house's income. Is it fair to just use them to make money and not give them a portion of that money? No. So they get money from that. The rest of you will have to find a way to earn money like you would in real life. And fantastic strategy. If they earn their own money, they will have a greater appreciation of it. Ida nodded in approval. Not only that, but much like in real life, you'll need to learn how to budget. Meaning you'll only be allowed to spend a certain amount of your allowance on these games. Izuka told them. What? Shouted a few kids who looked very upset at this revelation. I don't want you going into the real world and thinking you can spend your entire paycheck on things like this, Izuku told them. You'll have to learn how to balance how much you can spend on games and how much you'll have to spend on other, more important things. So you can only spend a certain percent of your allowance. Every week you'll come to me and you'll tell me how much money you have. Then we'll do the math together and I'll tell you how much you can spend on these games and the rest you'll have to save unless you want to spend it on other things. Awu. Many of the kids looked disappointed at this news, some of them more than others. Look at this way, the more you save, the more money you'll have next week, meaning you'll get to spend more than last week, Izuku told them. And this will also teach you to only spend on the banners that you really want something from. It may seem restrictive, but trust me, it'll save you a lot of struggling later on in your lives. So how are we supposed to earn money? We're not old enough to get jobs. Ken asked in a frustrated tone. Well, let's talk about that, Izuku said. Hello, my wonderful viewers. And as you may have noticed, I have created a second channel. Kiba was currently streaming in her bedroom, getting ready to play Black Essence 2 as she addresses her audience. Ooh, ooh, what's this? A second channel? But why? Lady Kiba, please tell us why. Wait a minute, is there super chat here? I know many of you are wondering for what purpose does this secondary channel exist, and the reason is quite simple. Kiba said haughtily. You see, my loyal minions, I have recently discovered the existence of gacha games. Oh no. Lady Kiba don't. It's a trap. Oh, that's why there's a super chat. However, despite these games being free, they are absolutely not free. And the in-game resources they give you in-game are simply not enough. As such, I need to pour money into these games to get what I want. Kiba explained. Aren't you rich? Don't you guys have lots of money? Yes, yes, we have lots of money. However, Caretaker wants us to earn money for things like this. As such, I need all of your assistance. Kiba continued. Not just for myself, but I also need to support my siblings. Fu and Shiruku especially, as they are now charging me for their services because of their crippling gambling addictions. Really? Fu has a gacha addiction. Fu. Emotionless. Blank stare, Fu. Yes, he plays far too many of them for his own good. Kiba shook her head in disapproval. I'm not proud of it. But I can't stop. Fu admitted. It's okay, Fu. I have that problem too. Same. 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 Now as for why this is on a separate channel. It's because when I make videos instead of streams, I can actually get ad revenue. 
Kiba explained, because my previous channel is demonetized due to all the blood and gore. As such, this channel will only contain non-bloody things. Like games. Suddenly, Kiba got a notification. Oh, the first super chat donation. 5,000 yen. Thank you very much. And you said Fu thought of this idea, didn't he? How did you know? Man, Fu really wants that money. Are they insinuating that Lady Kiba couldn't have come up with this on her own? Queen Crimson, aw, oh, not blood. Oh well, Kiba's cute enough to stay around. Well, regardless. On top of that, we also have where you can support us. But of course, you will be rewarded for your donations. You may even get the chance to suggest something we may do in a video. Kiba suggested, as well as various other rewards. We also plan on releasing merchandise. Wow, they really want their gacha money. Buying all of it immediately. Finally. Give me, give me, give me. I want it. I want it now. I value all of your support. None of you have to donate, but if you happen to have money to spare, then feel free to make an offering. Kiba said. And immediately after that, the donations poured in, securing their gambling addictions for a while longer. Izuka looked at all of the kids' phone usages once more, glad to see that it was down once again. His rules had had various effects on the children. For Netsu, Sansen, Kei, Kyoku, and Yanda, it resulted in them basically going back to normal. Only casually playing the games. And for Kiba, Fu, Ken, and Shiruku, it caused quite a few changes as they were now looking for money to spend. Well, not so much Kiba. Kiba got her money very easily, and so basically she would enlist people to work for her, and they pay them. Most notably Ken, Shiruku, and Fu. Fu and Shiruku also did already have quite a bit of income, but seeing as they had it the worst when it came to addictions, they were pretty greedy when it came to money. Although Shiruku only actually charged Kiba for clothing because she knew Kiba had the money to spend. That and Kiba had found that paying for her clothes actually made it satisfying. This had also inspired Shiruku to work even harder on making her clothes. Saying that one day she would have so much money she wouldn't need to worry about how much she spent on gotchas, which was good. Fukunoko was in between the two groups. She spent most of her time in her room so there was not much stopping her from continuing to play the games for a while, but she didn't really have a way to get income. Well, at least that was the case. A tea party. Fuku panicked behind her door. That's right. And this is my invitation to you. Kiba proclaimed from outside. W who else is coming? Fuku asked. Maybe if it's just a few people like Ari and Kei. Well, it's Ari, Kei, Fu, Yanda, Kyoku, and Nara, Momo, and Mina. Kiba said. Nope. Too many people. Fuku refused. I can't do it. Nope. Now that I know how miserable your lifestyle is, I cannot allow you to simply sit and rot in that room. Kiba proclaimed, you're going. I'm not taking no for an answer. Eep. Are you gonna break down my door? Fuku asked fearfully. Nope. But, if you come to the tea party, I'll give you 3,000 yen. Kiba offered. Fuku paused before taking out her phone and looked at Pokemon Master ZX. On one hand, it's super scary. On the other, Lily looks really, really cute in that dress. As Fuku was thinking this over, Kiba gave an additional offer. And you can sit between me and Eri. Don't worry. Nothing bad could happen with the two of us at your side. Kiba said proudly. There were a few moments of silence before Fuku gave her response. When is the tea party? Shy baking. Phew. And done. Sato whipped his forehead with a sweat rag as he looked down at his work. He had just finished seasoning and preparing meat for tomorrow's dinner. Now all he had to do was put it in the fridge and leave it to marinate for a while. EAP. Sato suddenly heard a high-pitched voice from behind him. He turned around and saw Fuku standing there in her hoodie with her face covered. Looking like a deer in the headlights and standing just stiffly. Oh hey. I didn't hear you walk in. Sato greeted the shy girl as gently as possible, trying not to spook her while also maintaining his distance in case her quirk activated. HH hi, Fuku said tentatively. I am sorry for interrupting. I'll leave now. Hey wait a second. Sato called out causing her to freeze. You don't have to leave, I was just finishing up here. It's fine. Fuku said. I, um, it's not, it's not, too important. Fuku nervously shuffled her feet, looking down at the floor with a dejected look on her face. So Sato wasn't gonna let that stand. Looks pretty important to me, Sato told her. I heard you liked cooking, were you trying to cook something for your friends? Fuku flinched at having her intentions revealed and kept looking away from the muscled teen. Why yes, Eri, Kei, Kiba, Kyoku and I are gonna have a sleepover in few hours and I wanted to make some sweets. I haven't really talked to Kyoku much before, but she's Eri and Kei's friend, so I want to be friends with her too. 
Hey, and I really want to make a good first impression. Sato gave the girl a bittersweet smile. On one hand, this girl was adorable. On the other hand, this girl was an anxiety-filled mess for the most depressing reason. But he could help her right now. Even if just a tiny bit. Hey, why don't I help you out? Sato offered. Ha! Huh. Fuku jumped back in surprise, looking at him curiously. W, why would you want to help me? Well, that's kind of my job here, kid. It's what your dad is paying us for. Sato chuckled. And it sounds like fun. I love baking. They don't call me the Sugerman for nothing, kid. I'll show you a whole new world of sweets. Fuku looked at him nervously. Judging his body language and his facial expression before looking away to silently mull over the offer. Okay, Fuku said almost too quietly for Sato to hear. W, what do you want to make? M. Exquisite. Kiba complimented as she bit down on a freshly baked cookie. The five girls sat in Kiba's room sitting around a table enjoying the various sweets and tea set up there. There were some chocolate chip cookies, machi, brownies, dorayaki, melon pan, cinnamon buns, and even a small cake and of course some candy apples. It's snowy, Kay said as she had a mouth stuffed with brownies. This is amazing fuku. Ari praised as she enjoyed a candy apple with a smile on her face. Ah. No one could even tell what Kyoko was saying due to the sheer amount of sweets stuffed into her mouth at the moment. I, I really didn't do much. Fuku said, her face red as a tomato. That big guy, um, I think his name is Sato, H. He was the one who did most of the work. MMM. It appears his sweets are even better than his regular meals. I must pay my compliments to him later. Kiba proclaimed before looking at Fuku. But we also must pay our compliments to you too, Fuku. After all, not too long ago, you wouldn't even allow Kay and the rest of us in your room. Now you're going up to people you only barely know and asking them for assistance. Such growth should be congratulated. Come, everyone. It's time for congratulatory head pats. No. Fuku cried as all her friends descended upon her, giving her the human contact she both hated and secretly loved. The next night, Sato was also in the kitchen cleaning up after preparing a meal. You, um... Sato heard a familiar voice coming from behind. He looked at the entrance of the kitchen and saw Fuku peeking in from the outside of the doorframe. Oh, Fukunoko, I hope you and the others enjoyed the sweets. Sato said. Why yes. Fuku said. They were very good. It's just, seeking you, no it's dumb. I'm sorry for bothering you. You want me to teach you? Sato guessed. Ah. Fuku shouted like she was being stuck after her intentions were found out. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I know it would be a waste of your time. After you helped me last night, I'm still asking for more. I'm sorry. I'll go back to my room. You'll never see me again. Kid. Sato gave her that same smile he gave her last night. I'd be more than happy to teach you. So calm down. I, why? Fuku asked, looking away once again. Why you're being nice to, to someone like me? I don't get it. I, I kind of understand why the people who live here are nice to me. This place is made for people like us, but you're not from here. Kid. People are like apples. They're born just normal, regular apples. Pretty regular and average. But they can turn into a lot of things, Sato told her. Midoriya is like a candy apple. He's sweet and he makes people happy, but you're Dadash, the man that hurt you. He was like a rotten apple. Terrible, disgusting, and he should just go in the trash. I like to think of myself as a candy apple. So naturally, I have to do what I can when someone asks me for help, right? I mean, that's the whole reason I want to become a hero. Fuku stayed silent for a few moments before speaking up. Is that why you're helping a rotten apple like me? Ah, kid. Sato got down on his knee and looked the girl in the eye. You're not rotten, not even close. Then why are you standing so far away? Fuku asked despondently. Sato cringed as he realized this wasn't a good look. He couldn't act like he wasn't afraid of her quirk going off especially when he was stuck in a room with her. But that wasn't her fault. Listen, I'm not gonna lie, kid. Your quirk is super scary. Sato admitted. But that's not your fault. Tell me, did you choose your quirk? No. Fuku answered immediately. I would never choose this quirk. Then it's not your fault, Sato told her. A person can't be judged by the things forced on them, but how they respond to them. When you got your quirk, did you ever want to use it on someone? No. No. I, that would be cruel, Fuku answered, looking sadly at the ground. Even doing that to rotten apples would be mean. And that's why you're definitely not rotten, Sato explained. Some people get unlucky like you did with their quirks. They go through hardships like you did, but they think that that is an excuse to hurt people. That because they were hurt, it gives them the right to hurt others. And that's how regular apples turn rotten. 
but didn't make that decision, you never meant to hurt anyone, and that's what makes you sweet. Fuku looked at him, stunned, before looking away with an intense blush on her face. Pa! Ma! Bibi! I have to go! The girl then immediately bolted out of the room, and Sato heard her quirk go off in the cafeteria. Oh! Sato waited for a moment and then gave a sigh of relief when he didn't hear any screams. And so after calling Izuku to tell him to make sure everyone steered clear of the cafeteria for a bit, Sato called Momo to ask her how to set up a lesson plan. New moves. Gah! Kiba cried as she was thrown into the wall of the training room. Before Kiba could even try to get up, a huge black hand belonging to Dark Shadow grabbed her and threw her into the ceiling. Oh Lord! Lady Kiba is getting stomped. Per Lady Kiba! That Yui student is insane! Kiba was currently streaming a fight between herself and Tokoyami slash Dark Shadow. Or rather, her getting beat by Tokoyami slash Dark Shadow. The room was almost completely dark. With only very dim lights and the door was also shut. Meaning that Dark Shadow was nearly at full power. Tokoyami considered this to be good training for both of them. As Kiba needed more fight experience and he needed more training on how to restrain Dark Shadow. Of course, he wasn't doing a very good job of it. Ra, hui. Dark Shadow roared as he smashed Kiba around the room. Eventually, Kiba was smashed down into the floor and pinned by Dark Shadow's huge mass. A-H! G-R-R-R-R! Kiba tried to fight back to lift Dark Shadow off of her, but to no avail. Dark Shadow was just too strong. All right, that's enough, said Izuku over the speakers in the training room. Immediately, the lights turned on and the door opened, revealing Netsu on the other side. Netsu then shot out a flamethrower attack at Dark Shadow, causing it to shrink very quickly. RGH! Dark Shadow cried as it tried to block the attack, to no avail, as it shrunk more and more. Eventually, Dark Shadow went back to normal size and Netsu stopped his assault. Thank you, Tokoyami said to Netsu as he was recovering from Dark Shadow's full power before he turned to Kiba. I apologize, I still have issues controlling Dark Shadow's full capabilities. He has a hard time controlling that. Dude! Imagine if that got unleashed in the city. Absolutely terrifying. Glad he's not a villain. Train harder, please. Well, at least we know they have a weakness. Endeavor would stomp. Humph. Kiba pouted as she pulled herself off the ground and dusted herself off. Don't apologize. You're still learning. And so am I. I have still yet to tap into my full potential. If I had, I would have easily defeated you. Kiba said all of this in a tone that displayed how sour she was at her loss. Sore loser Kiba is so precious. I love her. Even when losing, Lady Kiba looked elegant. Don't worry, my queen. Just wait until your body grows larger. Kiba got up and walked over to the camera, turning off night vision and addressing her audience. That will be all for today, my minions. I will see you at a later time. After getting treated at the infirmary, Kiba wandered around the backyard with a pout on her face. That cursed shadow is too strong. Kiba lamented. I must find a way to become more powerful. But how? I'm already training as much as I can without burning myself out. As Kiba pondered this conundrum, she saw Kirishima and Ojiro sparring in the court. There was a ring around them on the floor, so it appeared that whoever exited the ring would lose. Hmm. The tailman versus the one with enhanced durability. This will be a rather simple match. Kiba decided. How did Tailman even make it into U.A. with a quirk like his? Deciding to watch out of curiosity, Kiba stood nearby and viewed the fight. Kirishima charged forward with his arm and fist hardened, trying to punch Ojiro. Ojiro used his tail and pushed himself into the air, flipping over Kirishima and landing behind him before sweeping around with his tail. Kirishima held up his arm and guarded against the tail sweep and once it was blocked, Ojiro jumped backward to put distance between them. The hardening hero then jumped up and tried to punch Ojiro, but Ojiro swerved out of the way, jumped up behind Kirishima, spun around, and then smacked the fake redhead in the back, flinging him out of the ring. Nanny! Kiba thought in bewilderment. Kirishima tumbled onto the ground outside the ring, eventually coming to a stop on his back. Ack! Crap! You okay? Ojiro asked as he ran out of the ring and offered his hand to his classmate. Yeah. I'm fine. Kirishima flashed his classmate a sharp-toothed grin and took his hand, allowing Ojiro to pull him up. You there. Kiba came running and catching both of their attention. Oh, Lady Kiba. Kirishima smiled at her. Good to see you out and about again. Kiba stopped for a moment to smile back at Kirishima. It's good to be back, but now. Tailed one, explain yourself. Ha. Huh? Ojiro gave her a confused look. You not only managed to get into you.a but also managed to defeat someone whose quirk allowed them to withstand my blows. 
all of this despite your simplistic quirk. Kiba said, not wanting to directly insult his quirk. Well, my tail is actually a lot stronger than it looks, Ojiro explained. But the main reason is because I practice martial arts. Martial arts? Kiba asked, tilting her head. Yeah, it's basically learning how to fight hand to hand, or I guess in my case, hand and tail to hand, Ojiro explained sheepishly. It can be pretty essential for people who have to fight hand to hand with an opponent that's just as strong or even stronger than you. Opponents that's just as strong or even stronger than you. Those words were repeated in Kiba's head as an idea formed in her head. If that's the case, then teach me these martial arts. Kiba demanded. Oh, Ojiro was taken aback by this sudden request. I mean, I guess it'll be useful. What's the worst that could happen? I'm very sorry, Kiba said as he gave an apologetic bow to Ojiro, who was covered in bandages and laid up in a bed in the infirmary. How did this even happen? Izuku asked as he stood in the infirmary with his daughter. He'd finally felt well enough to stand again, and now this happened. Well, you see we ran out of punching bags, so I thought that if we were careful, she could spar with me, Ojiro said. That did not turn out so well. Izuka couldn't help but face bomb internally. Okay, never do that again. If you're going to continue teaching her, then you'll either have to use the restraints made for her or wait for the advanced training dummy replacement that can actually withstand Kiba's power. What happened to the old one? Kiba asked. Sansen melted it, Izuka answered, before turning back to Ojiro. Thank you for trying to teach her though, I think martial arts could really help her, although if you don't want to continue, I'd understand. No, I think I'll continue, once I've recovered and we get that training dummy, Ojiro said. Very good, wise instructor. I'll take even greater care not to break you next time. Kiba said with blazing determination in her eyes. Please, please do. Izuku and Ojiro said at the same time. Judging aesthetics. Everyone was outside because today there would be an event. That's right, today's class 1A's costumes would be judged by the kids of the house. The three judges sitting at a wooden table located in front of a stage were Shiruku, Kiba, and Nara. The other kids were also watching, sitting on the grass nearby, along with Kiba's viewers, through cameras set up by the vampire girl and operated by Fu and Izuku. Welcome everyone to Class 1A's costume display, Kiba shouted. Today we will be judging them based on the aesthetic of their costumes. Joining me today is my wonderful tailor and sister, Shiruku. Hello. Shiruka smiled at the camera, very excited about this. As well as our shape-shifting friend, Nara. Kiba introduced. Hey. Nara still wasn't used to being on camera but wasn't opposed to it. The three of us will rate each costume on a scale of 1 to 10, Kiba explained. So without further ado, let's bring out our first contestant, Yuga Aoyama. And with that, Aoyama walked on stage, clad in his sparkling armor and cape. Voila. So what do you think? Aoyama asked in his vaguely French accent, flaunting himself on stage. The three judges took a real hard look at him before speaking. It's so gaudy, Nara said but at the same time, it kind of works? Yeah, if you put that one on anyone else, I would say it looked terrible, but on him, it works. Shiruku added, which actually makes it even better. I like the Shining Knight theme, Kiba said. It adds to the hero feeling you're trying to portray. Overall, a very good start. The only real complaint I can make is that it may be a bit too bulky? Shiruka said, seeming a bit unsure of her criticism. But the design itself is good, if only for you. 8 out of 10. I'll give it a 9. Kiba decided. Knights are always cool. I'll just go with 8. Nara decided. And that brings your score up to a 25 out of 30. A good start. And hard to beat. Kiba praised Aoyama whom if you looked hard enough you could literally see his head getting bigger. HM. Bien sir, J and score a leave. I sparkle. Aoyama said proudly before walking off the stage. Was that French? What did he say? It translates to of course I score high. Is this guy French? Well, he's definitely unique. Doesn't that armor get hot? All right, next contestant. Shiruka called out. Mina Ishido. Mina ran on stage and posed, making sure everyone got a good look at her costume. Tata, what do you think? Awesome, right? Once again, the judges paused to think. I, I think I really like it. Nara said. Like the guy before, I don't think it would work too well on anyone else. Her alien appearance matches the strange colors and clothing. It makes her look like a superhero who came from a different world. And the mask is a really nice touch. Yes, that is exactly what I was going for. Mina said with a huge grin on her face. Well, you did it well. I agree with everything Nara said. But I really want to say I love the colors. Again, it adds something that says, this is Mina's costume. Shiruku added. 
It's so strange, Kiba said, still looking at her curiously. But a good stranger. 8 out of 10. I think I'm gonna give her a 10. Nara said. I really like this look. A9 for me. Well done, Mina. Shiruku applauded her. That puts you at our new highest at 27. Congratulations. Never thought pink skin could look so attractive. Or horns for that matter. You know she's still in high school, right? Future alien waifu. When can I buy merch? It's a bit too weird for me. Yes. Thanks, kids. Mina said before exiting the stage. All right, next we have Tsuyu Azui. Shiroku announced. Tsuyu walked on stage, making sure everyone could see her costume properly. Not being as showy as the last two. The judges took another good look at her before speaking. It definitely gives off the vibe of a frog hero, Shiruka said. I look at her and I instantly know her quirk has to do with frogs and that she's great underwater. So it's a complete success on that front. It's super cute. Which is weird because I never thought frogs could be cute before, but it just is. Nara said. And I love the way she does her hair. I know it's not technically part of her costume, but it really puts the whole outfit together. She looks like she belongs on a team. Kiba judged. Like she would look really good on a poster, standing side by side with other heroes. Well, I give her a, I'm gonna go high and say an 8 out of 10. Nara said. She made me see frogs differently, so that has to count for something, right? Yes, that is very respectable and it does carry a very superhero vibe to it. Telling you everything you need to know just with a glance. Shiroku added. But at the same time, it also doesn't pop out like the last two. If you put her in a crowd of heroes, nothing would make her stick out among them. So for that, I have to lower it to a 7. Hmm. I can see that. Still very easy on the eyes and makes good use of the frog theme. 7 for me as well. Kiba added. That brings the score to a 22. Not bad, but the lowest so far. My apologies, Sue. I do rather like you, but I must stay objective. I will never look at frogs the same way again. Agreed. She's so cute. It's okay. I'm happy with that score. Sue said. She really wasn't aiming to be super fashionable anyway, so it didn't bother her all that much. And without a fuss, she bowed and left the stage. Now for the fourth contestant. Tenya Ida. Member of the Ida family and younger brother in Ingenium. Shiruka introduced. So I'm expecting something similar. Ida walked on stage with his helmet on, displaying his costume for all to see. I hope this costume is satisfactory for both the judges and all those watching at home. After a few moments of staring at Ida, the judges spoke. I like this much more than your brother's costume. This feels a bit much, but this is more simplistic. And I like that it's a bit bulkier too. If I saw someone dressed like that running at me at the speed of a train, I would be afraid for my life. Shiruka said. It makes it seem like getting kicked by you would be like getting hit with a car. Yeah, it is very car-like, Nara added. I'm not sure I like how bulky it is actually. If you're supposed to have super speed, then why a suit of armor? Well, the armor is actually very lightweight, Ida said. It's not as protective as one would think. It's more built to guard against wind pressure than a villain's attacks. Well, I agree with Shiruku. The power displayed in this outfit is amazing. Look at those huge legs. Those are villains kicking legs. Kiba said. My only issue is that it's a bit too white. Yeah, yeah, I was thinking the same thing, Shiruka said. MMM. I'm stuck between 7 and 8. How about 7.5? I think I'll go 8, Kiba announced. 6, sorry. I may be biased because of XLR 8, but when I think of speedsters, I think of Slim. Nara judged. So that brings down the score for me. Sorry. There is no need to apologize for your opinion. Ida reassured her. Looks like Ingenium but small. Looks like a Transformer. Is he a robot? Anyway, that brings the score to a 21. Sorry, Ida. Kiba told him. As I have said, do not apologize for giving your opinions. I will take them in stride. As a hero should. Ida said before exiting the stage. All right, coming up next is a familiar face. A wonderful soon-to-be hero and our potential future mother. Achiko Uraraka. Shiruka introduced. No, I'm slash she's not. Shouted both Achiko and Izuka simultaneously. Achiko, now red-faced, walked onto the stage. You guys. Putting that aside, I have to say that I love the colors in her costume. And the way it shows off her figure. Don't you agree, daddy? Shiruku asked, looking at Izuku off to the side. I am not a judge. Please just continue. Izuka said, his face also bright red. Well, personally, I am also a huge fan of pink, white, and black. Especially with the helmet. It looks extremely cute. Nara judged. The belt was also a nice touch. The space theme is subtle but present, Kiba noted. However, judging this aesthetically, it's a bit too broad. 
it lacks the same uniqueness that was present in Aoyama and Mina's designs. It stands out a bit more than Tsu's but not too much. Maybe I'm biased because my favorite color is pink, but I don't see much wrong with it, Nara said. 10 out of 10 from me. 9 out of 10 from me, Shiroku added. Hmm. 8 out of 10 from me. Kiba decided. That puts you at 27. Tied for first place with Mina. Oh, surprise, surprise. Mina snickered on the sideline. She really does look good though. The future of female heroes looks bright. Again, still in high school. And she's taken. Thanks, guys. I sure hope you all were objective and didn't rate me so high because you like me. Achiko told them before stepping off stage. All right, now it's time for our next contestant, Mashiaro Ojiro. Shiroku announced. Ojiro nervously walked onto the stage, not used to having this much attention on him. Hmm. Well, it's rather simple, Kiba said after looking at it for a minute. Kind of plain. But I do like the fur on your shoulder, and those shoes are probably the best part. Shiroku noted. But why is the fur on only one side of your shoulder? It's such a strange choice, and I don't think I like it. It's just so plain. It's fine, but meh. Nara shrugged. Six. Yeah, I'll give him a seven. The shoes bring it up a bit. Shiroka said. Same. Sorry, instructor, but I need to give you a seven. Kiba said. That brings your score to a twenty. It's about what I expected, Ojiro said, rubbing the back of his head sheepishly. I'm not exactly flashy. He's so ordinary. Is his quirk just a tail? It's just karate GI. All right, next contestant, Shiroka said as Ojiro left the stage. Denki Kaminari. Yeah. Kaminari ran on stage, proudly showing off his costume. Give me what you got. All three judges gave him a good hard look. Well, it certainly has a good aesthetic. As well as containing an element of uniqueness. Shiroka said. But something's missing. It doesn't look heroic enough. Kiba said. It just looks like everyday clothing. It has style, but if I look at you, I wouldn't think you were a hero. I mean, yeah, but otherwise it looks great, Nara said. I think it's a pretty solid costume, even if it may look a bit too much like ordinary clothes. 8. I'm sorry, but it's too non-heroish. 7. Kiba judged. MMM. The other qualities raise it to an 8 for me. With the lack of hero aesthetic bringing it down. Shiroka said. So that brings your score to a 23. Ah, man. Kaminari sighed. A, at least it's not the lowest score. Man had the drip but not the plus ultra drip. He looks like the kind of guy to steal your girl. I think he looks great. 10 for me. Simp. All right, next up is Ijiro Kirishima. Kiba called out. Kirishima ran out onto the stage and flexed, showing off both his costume and his physique as well as activating his quirk. And here is an amazing hero costume. Kiba said almost immediately. Red and black is the ultimate color combination and the design itself is just wonderful and it works even better on him when hardened. The lack of a shirt shows confidence in his toughness and lack of fear, and the headgear makes his hardened face and teeth even more intimidating, and the rugged cape around your pants is a lovely touch. You look like a battle-hardened berserker, ready to take any and all of an enemy's blows before striking back with your own. 10. Immediately. 10 out of 10. The other two judges were taken back a bit by Kiba's enthusiasm, but after a few moments, they spoke their own thoughts. Well, it definitely gives off a tough vibe. And when you're hardened, it looks very intimidating. It's striking. But I'm not a 100% sure I love the arm gear things. But at the same time, I'm not sure it would work without them. It's very solid, well-descended, and unique. So overall, I give it a 9. Shiroka judged. Hmm. It's pretty good. Not sure I love the shoes, but it's definitely a good costume for a hero. Nara said. 8 out of 10. Well, I think those scores are too low, however, that brings you to 27, tied for first place. Kiba said. Very well done. As expected of one of my fans. Thanks, Lady K. Kirishima said. This dude is ripped. You could grind meat on his abs, good lord. Hi. Schoolers. Dude, why are you even trying? Simp's gonna simp. Kirishima ran off stage where Mina was waiting. Nice job, Kiri. High five. Mina said, holding up her hand. Yeah. Kirishima high-fived her. Horn buddies. All right, next we have Rikido Sato. Shiroka cued. Sato marched on stage, flexing his muscles to show off his costume. And the judges looked unimpressed. It's just a yellow jumpsuit with white gloves and boots. Shiroku looked disgusted. First off, why yellow? And why that shade of yellow? Very few things look good entirely in yellow and that shade is just gross. Also, there is nothing to break up the yellow. Aside from the gray belt and the white gloves, neither of which go well with it. It's just so boring and ugly to look at. Ugh. 
3 out of 10. And only because it at least looks like a hero costume. Oh, I'm gonna get roasted like a muffin. Sada winced. I mean, yeah this is not great. 4, Nara said. Keep aside. I apologize for this but I must give you a 2. This results in your final score being a 9. If it makes you feel better your cooking skills make up for your lack of fashion sense. Yikes, Sato said. I knew fashion wasn't my strong point, but geez. Oh wow, they roasted that man. Get the burn cream. Fast. Ouch. Moving on from that, Shiruka said with a bit of distaste. Mizo Shoji. As Sato moved off stage, somewhat embarrassed by the tongue lashing he received, Shoji walked onto stage, presenting his costume. You see. This is much better. Simplistic while also being easy on the eyes. Shiruka said. The use of blue and indigo is a very good choice given how easy they are on the eyes and the gold complements both those colors very well. It also looks very unique to yourself. And it looks just out of the ordinary enough to seem hero-like. 8 out of 10. Hmm. I don't know, it's easy on the eyes, but it's also very simple. 7 for me. The gold keeps it from being overly simple. Kiba said. I agree with Kiba. It's fine. 7. Nara shrugged. That brings up the score to 22. Not bad. Kiba said. Shoji shrugged. I tried to pick soothing colors given that the rest of me is not as easy to look at. Ah. Poor boy. What do you think is behind that mask? Hashtag smash quirkiest. Looks hot to me, big boy. Encouraging but inappropriate. High schoolers. Yelling into the sun man. Shiruka gave him a sympathetic look. It's okay. We all understand. Shoji nodded as he exited the stage. All right, moving on we have Kyoka Jiro, Kiba announced. Jiro tepidly walked on stage, trying to seem cool and not be nervous about being judged in front of a huge audience. The three girls just stared at her for a minute before speaking. Isn't this similar to Kaminari's costume? Kiba asked. Eh? Jiro wasn't expecting that response. Actually, yeah, Nara said. Black, pop collar jacket, shirt, black pants. It's all the same except that your boots are different, you have fingerless gloves and the shirt is a different color. And also the speaker things on your hands and boots. Huh. Somehow I never saw that. Kaminari said over on the side. Are you two dating? Shiruku asked. No. Jiro shouted in a panic. I mean I wouldn't be opposed, Kaminari said at the same time, winking at her. Sue, please slap him. Jiro said, her face now fully red. Whack. Ow. Kaminari was knocked into the dirt when Sue's tongue hit the back of his head. Thank you, Jiro said, trying to regain her composure. Meanwhile in Mina and Shiruku's head. Potential ship? Sundara X idiot. Well, I think I like it a bit more than Kaminari's, but just a bit. It shares a bit of the same problem where it just looks like clothes you could wear on a date. Kiba said. 7. I like the pink more than the white shirt, so I'll bump it to a 9, Nara said. I'll keep my score the same as well. 8. Shiruka said. Very fashionable, not very heroic. That brings your score to a 24, Kiba said. She's extremely cute when she blushes. Hi hi, Shilis. Interesting quirk. Once again the future of female heroes is looking bright. Jiro walked off the stage very flustered as Shiruka called out the next contestant. Next we have Hantasiro. Siro walked onto the stage, his helmet hiding his expression as the girls looked at him and judged. After about a minute, Nara's eyes widened as she came to a realization. Oh, your helmet's a tape dispenser. Oh, that's what it is. I knew it was something. Shiruka said. That makes sense. Overall, you did very well with the tape theme, given that it's a very odd theme to go with. And the colors are great, too. 8 out of 10. I still find the tape theme a bit odd to get over, but your handling was satisfactory. 7. Kiba judged. I think it's a fun look. 8. Nara judged. That brings your score to a 23. You should be proud of yourself, it's a creative costume. Thanks. Ciro gave them all a thumbs up. It's so weird. Tape man. Tape man. Does whatever tape CA? Have you ever noticed that tape is one letter away from you know what? What? Moving on, the last contestant, Fumikage Tokoyami. Kiba said. Tokoyami walked on stage and stood there as dark shadow came out of his cloak. So, so. What do you think? Hmm. It's just a black cloak with some black clothes under it. Nara said, seemingly underwhelmed. No, no, don't you get it? The cloak gives a mysterious and powerful feeling. He hides a beast underneath. One so powerful he won't need to lift a finger to defeat you. And that costume conveys that point very well. Kiba explained. Although I wish it had a bit more flair. So I'm going to give it an 8. I see where Kiba is coming from. But I do feel it's a bit too simple. Shiruku added. 7. I think you two may be overthinking it. 
but it's not bad to look at six? Nara shrugged. That brings your score to 21. Not bad, but you could have tried a bit harder. Shiruka told him. Told you we should have added a popped collar. Dark Shadow told Tokoyami. By the darkness, no. Tokoyami shuddered. Edge. Inert Kingdom Hearts joke here. Brooding teen phase intensifies. Oh look Shadow the Hedgehog turned into a bird. And that is all our contestants. Kiba said to the camera. Now this is not all class 1A. Not all of them were available and a few of them didn't want to compete. But these are all of our contestants. Tied for first place we have Achiko, Mina, and Kirishima. Shiroku announced. The three of them high-fived, smiling brightly at their shared victory. Next in second place we have the Shining Knight. Aoyama, Kiba announced. Though my medal is silver, it still shines. Aoyama said, taking it as well as he could. Lastly, in third place we have Jiro. Shiroka shouted. Jiro's face was still red as heck and Kaminari gave her a thumbs up and she pointedly looked away from him. As you can see, the future of heroes is bright, Kiba said into the camera. Almost none of them go below 20. Really bringing down the curve, Hasato, Mina said jokingly. Hey, I'm a hero student, not a fashion student. Sato laughed it off. So everyone please keep cheering them on. At least until I get to the UA and overshadow them. Kiba said. That's the end of today's stream. Thank you all for watching and have a wonderful day. Gotta catch them all. Pokemon Club Unite. Mina shouted. Around her, sitting on cushions on the floor, were the Pokemon Club. This club consisted of her fellow classmates, such as Kaminari and Toru. As well as kids from the house such as Eri, Kei, Kiba, Shiruku, Netsu, and Fuku, over video call, she still wasn't used to being around a lot of people. Kyoka was also a big Pokemon fan but was busy taking care of Izuku. Alright, seeing as this is the first meeting of the Pokemon Club, I think we should all start with our favorite Pokemon. Mina said, I'll go first. I think my personal favorite is Salazzle. They're so cool. And so vicious too. They're like a Pokemon Xenomorph that can breathe fire. Yeah, that seems pretty on brand for you, Mina. Toru giggled. My favorite is more Pico. They're the cutest Pikachu clone and their other form is called Hangry Mode. It's cute and relatable. Why go for a rip-off when the original is the best? Kaminari argued. Pikachu is my favorite. A total classic. Yeah, if you're basic. Toru and Mina snickered, gaining an irritated look from Kaminari. Oh. Oh me next. Kay said excitedly. My favorite is Arbok. It's a snake. And it's really big and has a big face on its chest. My turn. My personal favorite Pokemon is Giratina. Kiba announced proudly. It's a legendary and it rules a whole realm of shadows. It's super powerful and terrifying and cool. Of course, she would choose a legendary. Thought literally, everyone. Well, my favorite is Charizard. It's a cool dragon that has like a bazillion forms. Netsu added. Look Kaminari, you fellow basic men, Mina whispered to Kaminari teasingly. Says the girl who likes the furry bait Pokemon? Kaminari whispered back. I'll have you know that Salazzle is a reptile and therefore scaly bait. Mina argued with mock outrage. Well, my favorite Pokemon is Milotic. It's so elegant and beautiful. I adore its design. Shiruka gushed. The fan-like tail is my absolutely favorite part. I hope I can make a dress that can mimic its beauty one day. Oh, that sounds fun. We should all dress up in Pokemon outfits. Toru suggested. That sounds amazing. Kay agreed with starry eyes. Agreed. Shiruku, can you make those? Mina asked. Definitely. Shiruku's head was filled with ideas, looking at everyone to see what kind of costumes she could make. Before we get sidetracked, Eri. Fuku, you two want to share? Mina asked, trying to make sure the quiet kids didn't go unheard. Oh, um, I like Evie. Eri said quietly. It's really cute. Well, that's simple, Mina said. What's your favorite Eevee evolution? Um, Sylvian. It has pretty ribbons. Eri explained. Nice. Best one. Toru said before moving on quickly so no one could argue. Fuku, what about you? Um, I like Appleton. Fuku's face was super red under her hoodie and she was so glad she didn't show up in person. I'm sorry I know it's dumb but it's really cute and it looks like apple pie. And I don't know. I just really like it. I don't be ashamed, Fuku. Appleton's a fine choice. Toru said. She didn't have any strong feelings about Appleton, but she didn't hate it either. Hey Kiba, I'm guessing that most of your favorite Pokemon are legendaries? Toru asked. Well, since I'm legendary, why would my favorite Pokemon not be as well? Kiba scoffed. Although I am also quite fond of Hydreigon. Who is a pseudo-legendary? Which is like a legendary but not. Dark and Dragon. 
As unpredictable as ever, Lady K, Mina giggled. Well now then the next question. Favorite type? Mine is poison. Electric all the way. Kaminari said, giving the most predictable answer possible. Same here. Electric type is filled with cuties. Toru said, I like poison because it has snakes. K said, being just as predictable as Kaminari. Fire. Netsa said, continuing the trend of predictability. I mean, come on. I am fire. Nothing to be ashamed of, little dude. Kaminari told him. High five. I'm one fire. That would burn. Netsa said with the same enthusiasm. Oh yeah, Kaminari said. Ops. Mina, Toru, and Shiruku facepalmed at this display of incompetence before moving on. I like fairy, Eri said. M. I like the grass type. Fuku said. Plants are really cool. I like the grass type too. But I also really like the water type. Shiruka told them. And the fire type. And the bug type, I think the only types I don't like too much are ground and rock. I too am having a difficult time choosing. But for me, it is between dragon and dark. Kiba said, wearing her adorable thinking expression. On one hand, I am the queen of eternal darkness and I do adore dark types. But on the other hand, dragon is a very powerful type and most legendaries are dragon type. Hmm. The two girls took their time, thinking over what their favorite types were. I think I will have to go with Bug. Shiruka decided. It has so many beautiful Pokemon. Like Valcarona, Ribambi, Frost Moth, Leveny. And all the butterfly Pokemon. And Snom. Toru added. Don't forget about Snom. Everyone nodded as they agreed that Snom was a great Pokemon. Mmm, hmm. Kiba thought really hard about which type she preferred. You could see the cogs turning in her head as her brain got some much needed use. All right, let's look at my favorite dragon types. Haxorus, Rayquaza, Garchomp, Res Hiram, Zekrom, Curum, Zigard, Dialga, Palkia, Giratina, Hydreigon, which is also dark, Tyron Rum, and actually now that I think about it, the answer is dragon. Great now, uh, anyone want to play Pokemon Showdown? Mina suggested, having run out of other ideas. Off to the races. Outside on the tracks were the three of the fastest people around here. In the first lane was Kiba looking confident as always. In the second lane was Ida, looking far too serious as always. And Nara as XLR8 with the helmet over her face. All three of them had some strange armband on, colored differently for each person. Blue for Ida, red for Kiba, and pink for Nara. All right, today we will be seeing who can run the most laps. Ida shouted before looking over to a nearby device. This machine will count each time we go around the track, reading our armbands. Now without further ado, let us begin. Machine start. Starting. The machine said before giving a countdown. 3.2.1. Go. And with that all three of them burst off into a sprint using their quirks to their maximum capabilities. Nara bolted immediately going at stupid speeds. Kiba was next, not going as fast as Nara but still leaving Ida behind. Ida was amazed at how fast the two of them were going. It had only been 30 seconds and Nara had scored 17 points. With Kiba scoring 6 while Ida had only scored two. Is this the future of heroes? Ida wondered. It was this thought that made him feel both a sense of amazement and inadequacy. These were small children, and they were outspeeding him easily. Mind you, this place was for exceptionally powerful children, but still. One couldn't help but feel bad when being outdone at the thing they were best at by children who were not even in their teens. However, Ida still had something up his sleeve. Two minutes had passed. Nara was keeping a strong lead with 103 laps, while Kiba was behind with 56 points. Ida may have only had 37 points himself, which was far below the other two, but it was here that he confirmed his suspicions. They didn't know how to pace themselves. With Nara, it was less apparent due to the blinding speeds she went at, but for Kiba, it was a very apparent issue. Kiba's strength and speed would diminish the more she used her quirk, meaning that the pacing issue was showing twofold in her and she was now struggling to keep up with Ida. It was then Ida knew that the tables would turn very quickly. Seven more minutes had passed. Kiba was lagging behind now. She had 77 points, but she wouldn't be able to stay in the race for much longer. Nara was at 267 points, but Ida had a feeling she was about to fall out right about. Quirn. Now, in a flash of pink light, Nara was back in her normal form. To her credit, she kept running. She was actually pacing herself now, it seems she was gonna wait until she could transform again, but Ida doubted she'd have enough stamina to continue. And while those two slowed down, Ida sped up. As he reached beyond first gear, 
He may only have had 72 points, but things were about to change and fast. Yet another five minutes and Kiba had fallen out, finishing with 87 points. She had overexerted herself and now she needed to stop and drink more blood. That left only Ida and Nara and it was not even close. Nara had only gained one point, putting her at 268, while Ida was now at 142 points. He was still far behind, and now he was starting to feel a bit of fatigue, but this was nothing compared to Nara who was struggling to continue. He applauded her for not just giving up once she reached her time limit, but he doubted it would matter much. But they would see in another five minutes. Yet another five minutes had passed, and Nara had transformed back into XLR8. But it was clear that the fatigue was taking its course. Firstly, she was almost constantly tripping as her legs wanted her to just stop already. Her speed was less than half of what it was before and there would be constant lulls in her already decreased speed and her helmet was opened up because she constantly needed to catch her breath. She didn't stay in the race much longer before she stopped from exhaustion, ending at an even 300. Ida was now the only one left in the race and he was going much faster than when he first started. He gathered up a total of 217 points, and while he was a bit tired, he was more than able to keep going. Phew. Ida finally came to a stop, standing next to the machine and pressing the button to make it stop counting. Twenty minutes later, he'd managed to collect a total of 653 points. So safe to say he'd won. Kiba looked like she was on the verge of tears with how badly she lost, while Nara didn't look all too phased. Curses. To have such an embarrassing loss, Kiba shouted into the sky. Well, he's a UA student and the younger brother of a pro hero. It's expected that we'd lose. Nara said. Still, how on earth did you manage to last that long? I feel like I would have died if I just went on for another minute. Simple. The answer is pacing. Ida told them after taking a swig of orange juice. While there is a time for going at max speed, doing so will quickly exhaust you and leave you moving much slower or simply render you unable to move at all. Racing can be a contest of endurance as much as it is speed. Especially for you, Kiba. The more you exert yourself, the faster your body weakens. And Nara, while I admire your tenacity to continue even after your transformation timer ran out, it would likely have been smarter to go much slower and regain your stamina a bit. Until you could transform again. I see. Thank you for the advice, I'll try to take it, Heart. Nara gave him a polite bow. Kiba had an absolutely adorable teary-eye pout as she tried really, really hard not to seem bitter about her loss. I'll do better next time. Just you wait. The vampire girl had never been more glad in her life that she wasn't streaming this. A special guest. It was a relaxing day for Zuku. He had finished his smaller workload early and he was left with not much to do that day other than watch TV. And so Izuku was just chilling in his bed, watching the news, when suddenly there was an urgent knocking on his door. Come in, Izuka said. Momo came in with a seer floating next to her. There was a worried expression on her face that made Izuku feel uneasy. Um, Midoriya? There is someone here to see you. Momo explained. Is it more reporters? Or Kiba stands? Izuku asked, nervously optimistic that it was just the usual menaces. Um, I don't think so. I think you should take a look for yourself, Momo said. The seer floated towards Izuku and once it got closed it showed Izuku what Momo was so concerned about. And it made him freeze. Somewhere in the forest was a woman surrounded by Beowulfs. What made Izuku freeze was the woman's appearance. She looked just like an older, hornless Eri. Now, Izuku didn't know for sure who this was, but he had a strong feeling. After taking a few moments to get over his shock, he spoke into the seer. Hello. You are currently trespassing on my property. Izuka said, his voice only showing a bit of restrained anger. Please state your business. The women looked curiously at the seer, shocked that it had spoken, but after a moment to regain her composure and taking a deep breath, she spoke. My name is Tsuma Dorama. The woman introduced with a determined look in her eyes. I'm looking for my daughter, I think she ended up here. Her name is Eri. Momo looked at Izuka with concern as the boy just stared at the orb with a dark look on his face. The silence in the room was suffocating, and Momo was left wondering what exactly the situation was about. However, after a couple of minutes, Izuku lifted his head and looked at her. I'm going to take a few grim and step out, make sure that no one follows me. Um, you haven't fully recovered, is that really a smart thing to do? Momo asked him. I'll be fine, Izuka said, his voice was devoid of any emotion, but his eyes showed an anger and mistrust that she had never seen before. Don't tell anyone where I went. Especially Eri. Whatever this was about. It was very serious business. Okay, Momo said. Izuka turned back to the seer and spoke to Tsuma. Wait there, I'll come to you. 
Suma wasn't sure how much longer she could hold her nerve steady. Being stared at by the beady red eyes of these, things was intimidating even if she was fairly certain they wouldn't hurt her. And those weird clicking noises that Orb was making certainly didn't help matters. But she'd have to endure it. Otherwise, her whole trip here would be for nothing. After a few minutes, the circle of Grimm opened up and Izuku walked towards her with two bearing elves at his sides. One of them carried a round wooden table and the other one carried two chairs. The glare Izuku leveled at her was fierce, but Suma didn't flinch. She had expected as much. Place the table down between us and the chairs on either side, Izuku ordered. The Grimm did as they were told, arranging the table and chairs for the two of them. Once that was done, Izuku sat down, his glare never wavering, his eyes locked onto her. Sit, Izuku ordered. There was not a hint of politeness or hospitality. His tone was cold and harsh and left no room for argument. So she didn't argue. Suma simply sat down in the chair opposite to Izuku, trying her best to ignore the nightmare monsters surrounding them. You must be the caretaker then, Suma said, trying not to show fear and mostly succeeding, although Izuku could still hear a bit of a falter in her voice. Judging from my welcome, I think it's safe to say you know who I am and what I've done. Yes. But what I want to know is what exactly you're doing here, Izuka said. His voice was calm, but there was an easily detectable fury behind it. Straight down to business then. Suma sighed, taking a deep breath before she explained herself. I wanted to ask about Eri, how she's been if, if she's, if she's happy here. I'm curious as to why you think that's any of your business, Izuka responded, the fury in his voice becoming less and less restrained. Considering you abandoned her, saying you wanted nothing to do with her whatsoever, all while calling her a monster. I'll need you to explain why you would say all that, only for you to come here, on my property, and suddenly ask how she's doing. Suma recoiled at that statement, looking as if Izuku's words had sunk into her like daggers. I, I'm sorry. There was a long pause between them as Izuku's expression shifted from cold fury to boiling anger. You're sorry. Izuku repeated. You abandoned your daughter, gave them to your Yakuza leader father, called her a monster, and inflicted years of physiological trauma on her, that to this very day I am trying to fix and your response is that you're sorry. What else can I say? Suma started tearing up. Hi, my husband. He, he was a doctor. We met a while back. Back in high school, back when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. My father was, heavily encouraging me to work for him, to become the next head of the Yakuza. I never really wanted to but what else was I going to do and then one day I met him. I'd done something beyond stupid and broke my legs. I showed up and he did what he could before the ambulance got there. It wasn't just patching up my legs either. He stayed with me and he talked a lot. At the time I thought it was kind of annoying but once everything was said and done I was glad someone was there to keep my mind off the pain. After that we kept in touch and well I decided to go med school with him. And our relationship kept going from there until until one day he proposed. I was, he was, he was the light of my life. Without him, I would have just been another criminal. He was my everything, and then one day, while he was playing with Ari, he just, he just died. Tears were flowing down the woman's face as she tried not to sob in front of him. All while Izuku's expression remained cold. I, I was angry and scared. That I, I did what I did. Suma continued. And so you think that justifies anything? That it makes it okay to call your daughter a monster? To say that her quirk was a curse? To blame her for the death of her own father when you knew very well it was an accident? Izuka shouted. I understand maybe not wanting to raise her anymore after that. Giving her to an orphanage or maybe a family member that wasn't the head of the Yakuza. But you hurt her. Hurt her in one of the worst ways a parent could. When I found her, she was so confused as to why anyone would want to help her, would want to care for her, to show her affection. Because she thought she was a monster. That didn't deserve to be loved. And you think any of what you just said makes that right? No. Suma sobbed. No, it doesn't. I know that. I've known that for years. Everything I did back then, even, even after Hai's death, it's inexcusable when, when I got home after I, after I gave Ari away, I sat there in my empty house, surrounded by pictures of my husband and my daughter. And after the rage subsided, I kept looking at those pictures, her face and hair so much like mine, but she gets her kind eyes from her father. She was my daughter, and I, I gave her away. I gave away the last piece of high I had left. Izuka took a moment to look past his own anger at the woman who left Eri behind all those years ago and took a good look at the woman in front of him now. The word that came to mind was pathetic. If he looked closer, he could see the signs of despair beyond just the sobbing. Her hair for one was a tangled mess that looked like it hadn't been kept in years. Her clothes were wrinkled and ruffled as if she had been using them over and over again. Her baggy eyes were red. 
At first, he thought that was just because she was Ares' mother, but if he looked closer he could see that they were bloodshot. And she was thin. Very, very thin. Like she hadn't been eating. Lastly, he could faintly smell alcohol coming off her. Implying she was a heavy drinker. Either this was a very elaborate ruse, or she had genuinely been living in pure despair ever since she gave up Ari. Internally, Izuku's resolve softened. But only a bit. And he kept his guard up. Not letting any bit of pity show on his face. I, I tried to take her back after I realized what I did. But it was too late. Suma sniffled. My father already deemed me an unworthy parent. And refused to even see me or take my calls. I couldn't get her back. And is that why you're here? Izuku asked her harshly. To get Eri back? Is Eri happy here? Are you taking care of her well? Suma asked him once more. Izuka paused for a moment, thinking about his next actions before he took out his phone, did a few things, and slid it over to Tsuma. Suma took the phone and saw that on it was a picture of Eri playing a video game with Kei and Kyoku, looking very into it while also having a good time. Eri, Suma whispered tearfully. She handled the phone very carefully as if it were Eri herself. Keep scrolling right, Izuku told her. Suma hesitated for a moment before she lifted her finger and scrolled right. The picture changed, now it was of Eri learning how to swim with her inflatable unicorn floaties, helping keep her above water. After that was a picture of her trying apple pie for the first time as she looked like her eyes were about to explode out of her head with how wide they got. She was literally crying with how much she loved it. Next was a picture of Eri working in the greenhouse to grow an apple tree. Suma kept flipping through the photos of Eri. Dozens and dozens of photos of Eri being active, playing with friends, trying new things, enjoying her life. When she arrived at the last one, it was the picture from the amusement park where they were all together. Eri was surrounded by friends and family, smiling and happy. Suma was sobbing quietly while she took in everything she just saw and emotions bubbled up and exploded inside of her. Joy that her daughter was living happily. Envy at the fact that she had a part in none of that. Angry knowing that it was all her fault that she didn't get these moments with Eri. And despair knowing she never would. After a few minutes of crying, Suma very slowly put the phone down and slid it back over to Izuku. Well at, at least, Suma had to take a moment to compose herself after that before putting on an extremely forced smile. At least she's happy now. I'm doing the best I can, Izuka said, for the first time in the conversation, not sounding so angry. There's still a lot of trauma left over from what Overhaul did to Dash. Overhaul? Suma asked. Izuku froze as he realized that he accidentally said something he didn't want to say. Overhaul, that's, that's the Kai choice, right? Suma said. Kai took over the Yakuza after my father fell sick. Are you saying he did something to her? Izuka held his breath as he tried to figure out what to say. That's yes. I'll be honest with you. Yes, he did. But you don't want to know. W, what do you mean I don't want to know? Suma asked sharply for the first time actually looking a bit angry. What did he do to my daughter? I'm not telling you for your own protection. Izuka snapped. You were the one who gave your daughter to the crime lord in the first place. Family or not, you should know it's not safe. So even if you didn't know what was going to happen to her there, you're still partially at fault for it. And considering what he did and how you are now, I really, really don't think you want to know what happened to her. Suma backed down for a moment, taking a moment to ponder what Izuku had said. After taking a few minutes to think, she looked back at Izuku with a determined look that Izuku did not like. I, you don't owe me anything. I don't have the right to ask you for anything. Suma told him. But please, I'm begging you. Tell me what he did to her. I don't think, I don't think I'll be able to live with myself. I'm just wondering about it in the back of my mind for the rest of my life. Please. Izuka grit his teeth so hard he swore they might crack. After a few moments of consideration, Izuka gave in. Fine, Izuka said. But I need you to make me a promise. Anything, Suma replied. Don't kill yourself, Izuka told her, his voice deadly serious. WH what? Suma was completely taken aback by that request, her eyes widening in shock. Why would I, oh God, is it really that bad? I'm not going to sugarcoat this. Yes, it is that bad. Izuka empathized. If I'm going to tell you what Kai Chisaki did to Eri, then I need to know that I'm not about to commit a murder. Do you really want to know what happened? At this point, I need to, Tsuma said solemnly. And I promise, I won't kill myself. The two stared at each other for a while before Izuka sighed. All right, prepare yourself. This isn't going to be easy. Ahoy. Suma screamed as she sobbed into the table, hysterically crying as she had been for quite some time now. Izuka watched this pitiful display with a pained look. 
He still didn't like the woman in the slightest, and in a way, this was still her fault, but he knew that she had never meant for this to happen, and in the end, he still hated to see people suffer. He told her almost everything. Pretty much everything he could tell her. Of course, he didn't tell her about the quirk erasing bullets. But he told her all the horrors overhaul inflicted upon her. Both physically and mentally. All of which she technically had a hand in making possible. And he watched her break in front of his eyes. It reminded him of watching someone drown. You just looked at them suffer as the color faded from their face and light left their eyes. Eventually, it dissolved into sobbing, and by the end of the story she ended up like this. And so now he just sat there and watched, watching for minutes on end as the woman sobbed uncontrollably. It took almost an hour for her to calm down, as she seemingly ran out of tears and now was left with saddened, regretful eyes. A pitiful sight. I, I'm a monster, I, I, Ari, oh God, Ari. Suma buried her head into the table. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. It was then Izuka wondered exactly what he should say here. Because honestly at this point the woman was looking so pathetic that Izuka pitied her more than he hated her. He still obviously resented her but the edge of his anger had been dulled. But how should he handle this? He couldn't just wave it off saying that it was okay or you didn't know it wasn't your fault. Because it wasn't okay and it was about a quarter her fault. Should he say she should try to make up for it? That seemed like the better answer and it would give her a reason to not end her own life when this was over. But how? He wasn't letting her near Ari. That was for certain. Because as much as pitted this woman, it wasn't worth the psychological trauma it caused Ari to see her, just so that way she could try and make right the wrongs of the past. So what could she do? The two of them sat there, in silence for a good few minutes. Until eventually, Izuka spoke up. This isn't going to change anything. He told her. This won't undo the damage done to Ari's mind. Crying and apologizing won't fix anything. If you're really sorry, then you'll have to do something to try and work towards making her life better. The woman looked up at him, a spark of life in her eyes, as she took in Izuku's words and felt something close to hope. Yes. Yes, I'll ILL do anything. I own a hospital, it was my husband's before he, before he died. I have lots of money that I've just been sitting on. I have resources. I can I can pay for Ari's expenses. Or or anything. I have people who owe me favors. Anything. Anything you need. The woman said desperately like she was begging for her life. Izuka took a deep breath once more as he prepared himself for the rest of this conversation. Okay, if we're going to do this then let's establish some rules. Firstly, you can't come around here or have direct contact with Eri. I'm sure you can understand why seeing you again wouldn't be healthy for her right now. Suma winced and bowed her head. I understand. Good. Second, you will be paying for Eri's monthly expenses. This includes food, shelter, education, therapy, and the likes. I'll be sending an extensive contract your way in the next few days, listing the details. Izuka told her. Third, you're going to seek help. I know where this kind of depression can lead and just looking at you tells me if I don't intervene you'll be dead before the end of the year, promise be damned. You have no use for Ari dead and God forbid she finds about it and she blames herself for your death. The woman's eyes widened in horror before looking down at herself, seeing how much of a wreck she was and how little she had taken care of herself these past few years. Yes, I understand. Lastly, you own hospitals, right? That means you have access to top-of-the-line medical supplies, right? Izuku asked her, receiving a frantic nod from the woman. Good. I'll need some of those as well. Yes, yes, of course. Suma agreed. And that's all for now, Izuku told her. If I need anything else, I'll call you. I understand here. Suma took a business card out of her purse and handed it to Izuku. That has my phone number on it. Eri, Eri isn't going to find out about any of this, is she? No, not yet. Izuka decided. She's too young, and the trauma is still too fresh. She needs years of counseling and therapy, but after that, I'll tell her about this arrangement after all she deserves to know and once I do. What she does with that information will be up to her. If she wants to forgive you and reach out, form some sort of relationship, then I won't stop her. I will be watching very closely, but unless you do anything stupid, I won't intervene. But, if she decides not to forgive you and to never see you again, you must respect that decision. Am I understood? Suma paused, looking at the ground for a minute before speaking in a very hushed voice. Yes, I understand. Very well. Then I believe we're done here. Izuka stood up, snapping his fingers so the Grim would collect the table and chairs. You should get going before anyone sees you. The Grim will escort you off the premises. Suma stood up and bowed. Thank you. Thank you so much for everything. 
not just taking care of Ari but you've been kinder to me than I deserve. I owe you more than I could ever repay. I'm just doing what I think is right, Izuka said. And honestly, I can't bring myself to kick someone who's already down. Even someone like you. As Tsuma stood to leave, she said one last thing to Izuku. I'm glad that Eri ended up in the care of someone so kind. I know you raise her better than I ever could. And with that the woman promptly walked away, escorted by a small pack of Beowulfs. After she was out of sight, Izuku collapsed to his knees and let out all the air he'd been holding in. He felt so tired. That had been so exhausting on him emotionally and it hadn't gone anything like how he expected. Izuka didn't know what he was expecting but it wasn't this. He wanted to stay angry and upset with Eri's mother for what she did but the woman had clearly been suffering a fate that in Izuku's opinion was worse than death. Having gone through a terrible tragedy and made even more tragic by her own poor decisions. And now left with nothing but regret and anguish she just had to live the rest of her life like that. Sure it was her own fault but did she deserve to suffer like that? Did anyone deserve to suffer like that? Maybe? But it didn't feel right. At least not to Izuku. What would her suffering fix? What did anyone stand to gain from her pain? Nothing. It didn't help anyone. Not Izuku, definitely not Suma and not Eri. Oh lord, Eri. Izuku realized that he was inevitably going to have to have a conversation with her about this. He wasn't even mentally prepared enough to think about that. Izuku recalled his earlier words. That if Eri wanted to build a relationship with her of some sort, then he would let her. And he felt tightening in his chest. He didn't want to tell her. He didn't want to let her see that woman ever again. But Eri deserved to know. And she deserved to have a choice. As Izuku pulled himself to his feet, he looked up from the ground. And into the beady red eyes of Yami. So, tell me exactly what happened, Izuka said to his son. The two of them had moved back into Izuku's office, and after Izuka kicked out everyone else, it was just the two of them. Izuku and Yami sitting on opposite sides of his desk. Yami had been confused ever since what happened with Eri's mother. Like he didn't fully understand what he'd heard. Or couldn't process it. And he bore a bewildered expression even now. I, Big Spike. Big, Big Spike. Yami tried using his hands to show how big the spike was, lowering one as close to the ground as possible and raising the other one as high as he could, struggling a bit. Lots of sadness. Went to see, you were talking about Eri. I was confused. She died, but she's still alive. Eri's mother gave her away, but still was sad. A bad man hurt her, very bad. But why? Ah, Yami's still getting used to the world. It's no wonder things like this would confuse him. Izuka sighed. Looks like the hardest part of today was not behind him. Yami, all right? So let's break this down one bit at a time. Starting with Eri's mother. Yami nodded. Why did she give Eri away? Why did she come back? Well, as you know. Ari's quirk is very dangerous, especially if the people around her don't know what it does. And back when Ari first developed it, obviously no one knew what it did. Izuku explained. And so when Ari's father touched her back when her quirk first appeared, he died. Yami nodded. He recalled hearing about this. Of course, it was stressed to him that this was an accident and that Ari was in fact very upset about that. And as you can imagine, Ari's mother was not pleased about the love of her life, dying. And in her rage and grief, she took it out on Eri. She blamed Eri for his death, told her that she was cursed, left her with her grandfather, and then abandoned her. Izuka said, pausing to give Yami time to take that in. The grim boy paused to think about it, trying to put himself in the woman's shoes. How would he react if Eri or any one of his siblings accidentally killed Izuku? The moment that thought entered Yami's head, he scowled, feeling an intense pain in his chest at the thought of losing Izuku. Izuka had given him everything. He was the parent he never knew he needed in his life and opened up a whole new world to him. He was kind and patient and cared so much about him and his siblings and honestly Yami doesn't know what he would do if that happened. But would he treat the sibling that did it the same way Eri's mother did to her? Even if it was an accident? He recalled back to when Izuku collapsed. All the negativity every single person in the house felt. The intense fear and despair instilled into the hearts of every single child in the house. Honestly, Yami doesn't think he could feel anything but sorrow for whoever was unfortunate enough to do that. So why did Eri's mother do what she did? Why? Yami asked, still confused. It was an accident. She was sad. So why did Eri's mom do that? Yami, you have the ability to see what other people are feeling. Not everyone can do that, Izuka told him. Some people can't see past their own pain and suffering. Pain anger, if not processed correctly, can blind a person and make them do horrible, terrible things. And that's what Ari's mother did. 
and the minute her anger started to fade and she realized what she did and how bad it was. But it was too late to take it back because her father and then later overhaul wouldn't let her. So for years, all she could do was suffer not knowing what happened to her daughter and regretting her decision. Until one day, she heard about the downfall of the Yakuza and then eventually learned about this place. She put two and two together and figured that Eri probably ended up here and realized that she could actually see what happened to her. So she felt bad because she did bad things in anger, but when she stopped being angry, she felt sad, Yami said, trying to understand what his father was telling him. That's right. Izuka nodded. Never decide things out of anger. Most of the time it leads to doing things you'll regret. Sometimes it can ruin your life. That's why therapists exist. Therapist. Yami repeated. Ah, uh, therapists are people that, they're like doctors. Izuku explained. But instead of healing people's bodies, they heal people's minds. Heal, minds. Yami repeated, slightly confused. Well, do you see the pain that Fuku and Otoko and most of the other kids feel? Izuka asked Yami who nodded in response. Well, that's not physical pain. That's mental pain. It's why they're so sad and in some cases angry. Therapists can help them not be so sad or angry anymore. They're about as important as actual doctors and can do as much good. Yami remained silent, contemplating what Izuka had told him. A therapist could help people who were suffering like his siblings, like his father maybe. Like all those people in the city that he absorbed negativity from. But then again, there was something about that statement bothering him. Why, isn't there therapist here? Yami asked. Why aren't therapists fixing more people? Why so much suffering outside? Izuka paused as he tried to find a way to answer this properly. Okay. So the thing is, unlike doctors, people aren't as willing to see therapists. For many reasons. Some people just don't recognize that they need to see one. Some people can't afford therapists or can't see them because their parents or guardians won't let them. And some people, some people think that it makes them weak. There's this thought among people that strong person shouldn't have to get help. And since no one wants to be weak or admit weakness, a lot of people just don't get the help they need, even if they know that they need it. If people went to therapy more, there would be a lot less suffering in the world. The green teen was not proud to say he was venting a bit towards his son. Venting about himself because his self-loathing was acting up again. After taking a moment to calm himself, Izuka continued. The reason why your siblings haven't gotten any therapy is because I have not been doing my job well and I've had issues trusting people with you guys. But I am looking into it now. Yami once again sat there and took all of this in. He once thought there was a lot of suffering in the house. Kids like Fuku and Kyoku carried a lot of pain with them. Eri and Koda as well to a lesser extent as well. Even the typically happy ones like Kiba, Shiruku and Kai carried some negativity with them. But that was nothing compared to what he saw in the city. He'd only ever been there one time and he'd seen that the suffering in this place, the negativity here, was nothing compared to the sheer amount of negativity in the city. And it wasn't just because of the difference in the number of people, the amount of negativity coming off some individuals were more than all of the kids in the house combined. He'd seen Kiba's despair firsthand and he hated it. He hated watching her feel that way. And there were people out there who were feeling so much worse. And that just didn't feel right. Now about what you heard about overhaul. Izuka continued, snapping Yami out of his thoughts. I hope you're not too affected by the description of what happened. It's rather horrifying. Ah uh, yes, Ares torture. Honestly, Yami just had a hard time comprehending that. From what he understood, something very, very bad happened to Ari. That hurt a whole lot. And was treated very badly. That explained why she acted the way she did. However, Yami couldn't wrap his head around one thing. Why? He asked once again. Why did he hurt her? He just wanted blood? You take blood from Ari, but you don't hurt her like that. So why did he do that? Izuka paused before answering. Yami, there are some people who are just, they are bad people. For different reasons, some people are hurt so they want to or feel like they need to hurt others. Or just because they weren't taught to value other people. I don't know why Overhaul did what he did or why he became a bad person. But it doesn't justify the horrible things he did to Eri. There was another moment of silence as Izuku waited for Yami to process this. So, is Eri's mother also a bad person? Yami asked eventually. You were being mean but also nice to her even though she hurt Eri. I don't understand. Once again, Izuku responded to this with a sigh and a pause. Although this conversation was nowhere near as difficult or precarious as his conversation with Eri's mother, but it still took a tax on him and he need to think carefully about the best ways to explain everything. 
Otherwise, this could have a negative influence on his son. What makes a bad person is subjective, meaning that it's up to each individual person to come up with their own opinions. For example, if you like ice cream and you say that ice cream is the best, you may think that, but someone else may have a different opinion. And there is no right answer. So that makes it subjective. Izuku explained, deciding on whether or not you think someone is bad comes down to a few factors and it can be very complicated. But for the sake of simplicity, let's look at how Aries' mother was, what she did, why she did it, how she feels about now, and what she's doing about it now. I'm going to explain this from MY perspective, but other people may feel differently about each factor. Yami paid close attention, hanging off each of Izuku's words as he explained this complicated situation in the simplest way he could. Aries' mom was once a loving mother. She loved her daughter, and she loved her husband very, very dearly. Then one day, Aries' court came, and she accidentally killed her father. Now I understand that she was upset, to say the least. She lost someone she cared about more than the world itself. But what she did, telling Aerie those horrible things, blaming Aerie for her father's death, and giving her to a Yakuza boss, even if he was her grandfather, was not the correct response. It was a terrible thing to do. She should have gone to a therapist to help her cope. She should have known that saying things and making decisions while you're angry and grieving, especially when those decisions hurt your child. But at the same time, she was grieving. Izuku explained. Everything she did before and after her burst of rage suggests that what she did was not something she would normally do and that she regrets it deeply. But that doesn't change that what she did was terrible and something no parent should even consider. So at that point, the question becomes, should you judge a person one what they do when they're at they are at their worst? At their worst. Yami repeated. Right? When a person is at their worst is when they become overcome by despair and typically that's when people make their worst decisions. Izuku continued. Do you remember when Kiba locked herself in her room and made herself suffer? That was her at her worst. She was so upset about what happened to me that she made a terrible decision that hurt her and the people around her that she would never make normally. So, is it a right to judge someone at their worst? Normally, I don't think so, but what she did was just so terrible, I can't really call her a good person. But I can't call her a bad person either. So she's just a person? Yami asked. Yes. Yes, that's exactly what she is. Izuku was elated at the fact that his son seemed to be understanding this. She's a person. Not good, not bad inherently, but capable of both. Again, this is just my opinion. I'm sure some people would still say she's a bad person, despite her reasons. And I don't blame them, but I honestly couldn't stand to see her suffer to that extent. I don't think anyone deserves to feel like that, even if they did something terrible. Yami recalled the sheer intensity of her sadness. Almost unlike anything he'd seen before. It was far worse than Fuku when she came here or Kiba during her depression. He struggled to think of a reason why someone would deserve that. Some people would say she deserved it because she did it to herself, but why? What good does her pain bring anyone? Izuku asked, Will her suffering fix what happened to Eri? Or make Eri feel better? No. That's why I treated her the way I did. Because even though I don't like her, I can't bring myself to let someone wallow in their own pain. If she and Overhaul had therapist, would they be better? Yami asked. Aries mother, I'm sure. I don't know about overhaul, but probably? Izuka said. Therapy can help with a log, but they also have to be cooperative. If a therapist is giving you advice and you don't listen or take in any of what they say, then it's not going to help much. The therapist also has to be good at their job. If not, they may end up doing more harm than good. But if you have that and with enough time, I believe therapy could help pretty much anyone and I fail to get any of you a therapist yet. There was a few seconds of silence before Yami left from his chair, went around Izuku's desk and lunged at him before wrapping his arms around his waist, bringing him into a hug. Ha! Huh, where did this come from? Izuku was quick to hug his son back, although he was confused by the sudden embrace. You looked like you needed it, Yami explained. Does it help? Izuku smiled, genuinely feeling touched. Yes, yes it does. After that, the two just sat there and enjoyed the embrace for a few minutes. All right. Thank you, Yami, but I think we're done here. Izuka told him. Unless you have any more questions? Yami paused. He could probably ask more questions, but it was clear his father needed a break. No. I'm fine. All right. Well, then you should go back to your room. Dinner should be ready soon. Izuka said after looking at his clock. Remember, don't tell anyone about what happened here. Especially Eri. She's not ready to hear about this yet. One day she will, but not yet. Oh, and tell Yanda to come here. I need to explain this to her. 
Given her quirk, trying to keep secrets around her is a moot point. Yami nodded and started leaving to go to his room. He had a lot to think about. Sleeping proved to be difficult for Yami. He was stuck thinking about that conversation and about what he had seen in the city that day. Yami had not seen the entire city. Only a small portion of it. There was probably still so much suffering he hadn't seen. And that suffering lead to other people's suffering. But why did he care? He didn't know these people. They didn't do anything for him. In fact, he was told he was considered a monster by most of the people outside. So why was this bothering him? Could it be because of his need to give back? Generally, Yami found that when someone gave you something, you should try to return the favor. This is why Yami would give Izuku everything. Because Izuku gave Yami everything. And kept giving him everything. And his siblings gave him a lot. They gave him kindness and companionship, two things that he never knew how he lived without up until this point. But they weren't the only one who gave him things. Everyone did. Literally everyone. The people of the city gave him their suffering. Fuel for his grim. Sure, they didn't give it to him on purpose. But it was still a gift. Or maybe the reason it bothered him was because their suffering could lead to his siblings' suffering. Maybe if all his siblings' parents had therapists, then they wouldn't have treated them badly. Or maybe if more people in the world had therapists, maybe they wouldn't be so scared of him and his siblings. Perhaps if he did something to help them feel less afraid, his siblings wouldn't suffer as much. Or was the reason it bothered him that much was simply because, well, he just didn't like people suffering. Maybe his father was rubbing off on him and Yami didn't mind it though. He loved his father, so the idea of being more like him didn't bother him in the slightest. It could just be all of those things. But he needed to see more. To understand more about the world outside this house and the forest, he needed to head out into the city once more. In the early hours of the day is when Yami left the house. It's not like he really needed to sneak out. Going into the forest was not really something special and since no one was watching he could just leave. The only thing that would really stop any of the children from just leaving was the seers which Yami controlled so not much of an issue. While Yami was sure his father would be worried if he noticed he was gone, Yami needed to see these things himself, by himself. If he had gone with a supervisor, they likely would have restricted what Yami could see. And he didn't want that. And so Yami went out into the city. After a bit of walking, Yami reached the city streets and was immediately met with the feeling of negativity rushing into, coming from the people around him. To explain Yami's vision, Yami would see auras around people with numerous different colors flowing around them with the dominant emotion being the dominant color. He wasn't sure what all the colors meant exactly, but he'd figured a few things out. Red was anger, black was sadness, purple was fear, and yellow was happiness. There were of course more colors and the colors came in different shades. Yami didn't quite know what that meant. These auras would always be clear to Yami. He could even see them through walls. The more intense a person's emotions, the higher the person's aura, some of them reaching above some of the buildings. Which is what he was seeing right now. Pillars of negative emotions blazing like huge fires above some of the smaller buildings. Yami reasoned that if he wanted to see the suffering of the people firsthand, then he should probably head to the highest sources of negativity he could find. And so he made his way towards the largest concentration of negativity that he could see from here. But as he walked, he noticed something. When he walked past the people on the sidewalk, they would look down at him. He would see the look in their eyes change and their fear rise before they walked slightly faster. It didn't take a genius to figure out what was scaring them. He walked past a plane of glass and took a look at his reflection. His pale skin, his black nails, his sharp jagged teeth, his black scara, and his beady red pupils. His form was frightening. He'd been told so numerous times. He'd even scared Ari a bit at first, although she'd gotten over it rather quickly. But these people seemed far more fearful of him than Ari was. Which told him that this was something he'd just have to expect in the outside world. Still, not much he could do about that, so Yami just continued to head towards the negativity. The source of the field of what Yami now called negativity geysers had led him to the Purr neighborhoods. The slums of the city contained much worse-looking buildings. Most of them were just run-down houses and abandoned structures along with some small stores with the nicest-looking buildings being apartment buildings, but even they didn't look all too nice. Trash littered the cracked streets and sidewalks, and even the air here seemed worse somehow. Also, the types of people he'd seen around had changed. Now you could tell they had less money or less care for their appearance. There was the occasional homeless person from time to time, all of them carrying some sort of alcohol. Yami had actually seen a bit of this type of neighborhood before when Yudata drove him around, but that was just a glimpse. Now that he was seeing the full thing, it was shocking. Yami had only known two types of living. 
his life in the forest and his life at the house with Izuku. Two very different types of lifestyle, but they shared something in that their surroundings weren't this depressing, at least the forest looked nice. He would have rather slept in a cave than slept in an alleyway like he saw some of these people doing. And somehow they smelled worse than he ever did. Now Yami understands why there was so much negativity here. These people looked miserable even without looking at their auras. Something Azuka taught them was the power of money. It provided them food, a home, all those games, and other things they used to keep them entertained. You couldn't really live without money and Azuka had a lot of it. This was seemingly what happened when people barely had any money. They didn't have good food or good houses or anything that Yami had. So Yami looked around the area with pity. These people were so sad and scared. He doubted that therapy could help these people. What they seemed to need was money. Why didn't they have money? Why were they so poor? Couldn't they just get jobs? Why didn't anyone help them? Ah, hey. Speaking of helping, Yami turned his head towards the sound of the scream and saw nearby a young girl was getting her bag snatched by a disheveled looking man. Help. Someone help. The girl cried out as she hung tightly to her bag. Just, just give me the bag. The man shouted desperately as his weak, skinny arms tried to steal the bag. Now, something Yami noticed about this encounter was that they were both terrified. In fact, the man was actually more terrified than the girl was, much to his surprise. That didn't seem to make sense to Yami. He wasn't being robbed and it's not like he had much to fear from a girl who was a third of his size. However, looking at him and thinking about more, it started to make more sense. This man looked like he hadn't tasted food in weeks. That must be why he was so desperate for this little girl's bag. He wanted money for food. Dad was right, suffering makes more suffering. Yami noticed. I should do something. And so Yami ran in and did what he thought was best to end the issue. He took a stack of cash out of his pocket and tossed it at the man's face. Ack! The man was so taken aback by the sudden attack to the face and stumbled back, releasing the bag as the money fell to the ground. What the dash? Ha! The girl's eyes went wide in confusion as she didn't expect someone to throw cash at her attacker's face. The man picked up the stack of money, looking down at it with shock and confusion before looking back at Yami. Did, did you just throw money at my face? Go. Leave. Buy food. Yami commanded aggressively. The man paused for one moment before running away as fast as he could, holding the money to his chest. After Yami watched him walk off, he turned to the girl. It was clear that she didn't live around here. Her bright yellow blonde hair was very well kept and styled. She wore a clean white dress with frills and decorations that implied it was rather expensive, her red shoes telling the same story, as well as her sun hat with a red ribbon in it. As for her aura, it was mostly white right now, which guessing from her expression indicated shock. When people are shocked, I should wait for them to calm down. Yami thought, trying to recall the advice Izuko had given him. And so he waited. And the two stood there in awkward silence for a couple of minutes, Yami just staring at her. Eventually, the girl got over her shock and was just confused and somewhat frightened by Yami's eyes boring into her. Seeing the fear in her rise a bit, Yami assumed it was because of his appearance again and so he decided to try to say something to ease her fears. I'm not going to hurt you, Yami said bluntly, his expression unchanging. Oh, uh, thank you? The girl said awkwardly, her fear subsiding just a little bit but not much. I mean, thank you for saving me. But was it really okay to throw money at that man? It's fine. Yami shrugged. Yami, despite not falling into the gotcha craze, did start getting an allowance. Seeing as his grim did so much around the house, Izuka decided that he was one of the kids who'd gained passive income. Yami didn't have anything to do with this money, so he just hoarded it. He figured he should take it with him in case he wanted to buy food or something. And so throwing a little bit of that crash away really didn't bother him. Oh, well, thank you again. You really saved me. The girl gave him a bow. My name is Amina guy. It's a pleasure to meet you. Yami Midoriya. He introduced himself. You don't live here. Ah, uh, yeah. I don't. Am um, I said awkwardly? I came here to give out my candies to the people here so they wouldn't be so sad. Candy? Yami titled his head in confusion. Yes, my candies. Amai's um, face brightened and she quickly dug into her bag and took out a small yellow piece of candy that looked like a skittle or M&M. &M. Here, try one. Yami took the small piece of candy and immediately popped it into his mouth. And immediately he felt a sense of euphoria. The candy tasted like happiness and filled him with a feeling of warmth and joy. When Yami finished chewing it he was wide-eyed as the joy the candy had given him continued as his mood improved. Amai's smile brightened as she saw Yami's wide-eyed look. It's part of my quirk. 
Mood candy. It lets me make candy that tastes like my mood. That's a very nice quirk. Yami praised her. Very good quirk. Oh, oh. Um, no one's ever said that about my quirk before. Um, I blushed a bit and Yami saw her aura become mostly yellow. Thank you. You're really nice too. Yami nodded. So you came to give people happy candies to make them feel not so sad anymore? Aha. Uh -huh. I heard that the people in the Purr neighborhoods were so sad, so I thought if I gave them my candies I could give them a little hope. Um, I said bashfully, shuffling her feet. I've been doing this for a while now but I'm not sure I feel safe doing that now. Yami saw her aura turn black as sadness washed over her, along with fear. And so without thinking too much about it, he made a decision. Why don't we go together? Yami asked. I can protect you. Really? Amai asked, taken aback by the offer but was ecstatic for it nonetheless. She felt like Yami could really protect her, seeing as he looked absolutely terrifying. Yami nodded. I wanted to see upset people. Amai once again looked confused. Why? I want to understand them, Yami answered. The blonde girl gave him a curious look. Understand them? Do you want to help them? Yami paused. Maybe. Things are confusing me. I want to look at them and figure out what I want to do. Hmm. Well, I think that helping people who are sad is just the right thing to do. Maybe if you see them you'll think so too. Amai thought. Come on, let's go. Amai offered her hand to Yami who tentatively took it as she dragged him off to go cheer up the less fortunate. Bless you too. A disheveled old lady with a trash cart said, smiling at them as she walked away with her garbage. Yami watched the lady as she walked away. Before they'd gotten to her, her aura had been a soft black, but now it was a soft yellow. Not bursting with joy, but much happier than she'd been before they got to them. This had been the case for many of the people Yami and Amai had gone to. But something Yami noticed is that sometimes Amai wouldn't even have to give them the candy for them to feel better. Sometimes all they would have to do is approach them and tell them of their intentions and they would smile and feel better. Not all better, but noticeably better. It taught Yami that maybe sometimes just showing that you cared could brighten someone's mood. Of course, the candy would do wonders for their mood. And it was pleasing to see these people gain a little bit of happiness in their seemingly sad lives. After doing this for a couple of hours, it seemed Amai was finished here. That's all the people I can find around here, but I still have so much candy. Amai frowned as she looked into her bag. Hmm. Yami looked up. The amount of negativity in the area had subsided quite a bit, but that was just in this part of the city. There were still other parts of the city with negative geysers. We can go to other places where people are sad. That's a good idea, but how would we find them? Amai asked. I can see them, Yami explained. With my quirk. Your quirk lets you see people's emotions? Amai asked with a slightly amazed face. Yami nodded before pointing somewhere. There's more bad feelings over there. Lots of them. Well then let's go cheer them up. Amai said with a determined look in her eyes and a smile on her face. Show me the way please. Yami nodded and led the way to negative geysers. As it turns out, the negative geysers had led to a battle. A battle between heroes and villains. The villain Rikia Katsukame, a former member of the Yakuza, had broken out of prison and was on a horrible rampage, having stolen some trigger that further boosted his abilities, allowing him to steal vitality from people without even touching them. Meanwhile, the heroes that had arrived to stop him, Death Arms, Ryukyu, and Crust, were all struggling to even stay upright as all the other lower rank heroes had fallen. The area around the fight was in ruins, buildings had been smashed apart and collapsed, stores were in complete shambles and there was rubble everywhere and Yami could see that there were lots of people trapped under it. With their vitality drained and too exhausted to move a finger. There wasn't even a police perimeter as any of the police that showed up had had their vitality drained and they were left immobile on the ground. Oh my. Amai put her hands over her mouth as she looked at this disaster in horror. R.H. Death Arms threw a punch at Rakia and punched back, and when their fist clashed, Death Arms was thrown back on the ground, his arm nearly breaking from the blow. Ack! Rakia stood above Death Arms, raising both his fists, ready to end the pro hero. But then Crust jumped in and raised and created a shield, blocking the attack, but Rakia just kept attacking. Crust grit his teeth as Rakia's fist pounded on his shield. Each attack made him want to collapse. As Rakia drained more and more of his stamina with each passing second, he could just barely keep up this defense. Ryukyu jumped on Rakia's back and bit into his shoulder, the dragon hero making sure to sink her teeth deep into the huge muscle-bound villains. Get off me you crazy bitch! Rakia grabbed onto Ryukyu's head, draining her stamina even faster as he forced the dragoness off of him as she was too exhausted to resist and he threw her to the side. This is terrible! 
Amai gasped, tears sparkling in her eyes as she bore witness to this disaster. Meanwhile, Yami just observed everything around him. Unlike the last place, they went to which was full of sadness, here the prime emotion was fear. The civilians were afraid, the police were afraid, even the heroes were afraid. Everyone was afraid except for Rakia himself. He was engulfed in happiness, taking joy in the destruction and pain he was causing. And that somehow made it all worse. Not just the pain around them, but that the person causing it was taking pleasure in it. Rakia grabbed Crust and started draining his vitality faster while crushing him in his massive hand. Yami, seeing how bad this situation was, prepared to intervene. He knew using his quirk like this in public was illegal, but given the situation, he was willing to break the law. Fortunately, he didn't need to. Suddenly, Rakia shrunk down to his normal size, his strength faded, and he stopped absorbing other people's vitality. Ha! Huh. What happened to my Chuak? Rakia didn't get the chance to finish his sentence as Mirko kicked him in the face, knocking him out as his body flew to the side before skidding to the ground. Ha! Huh. Got the bastard! Mirko said before looking back at a nearby alleyway. Hey, Eraser! I didn't need your freaking help. Aizawa came out of hiding and revealed that he was the one who weakened the villain. That remains to be seen. Ah, eraser head. Mirko. Crust shouted with pure relief. Thank you for coming to our aid. The villain injected himself with trigger and proved to be more powerful than we initially thought. We need to get him restrained immediately, Ryukyu said, reverting to her human form, panting heavily as she struggled to stay upright. Meanwhile, Thirteen was running in, having followed Aizawa here. I'm here. Let's get the rescue operation started. There's no doubt that people are trapped under all this rubble. We need to get them out before they run out of air or before the rubble shifts and crushes them. Do we know when Wawa Mami or any other rescue heroes are gonna arrive? Death Arm said. She's out of the city doing a photo shoot, Aizawa said, not doing much to hide his disdain. Ragdoll's doing a mission on the other side of the city. And without them it'll take us hours to find everyone under this rubble. Someone might die if we take that long. Crust pointed out. Yami heard that conversation and he realized something. He could see them. He could see all the people trapped under the rubble. He could see everyone that was trapped. He could do something here. And so Yami ran forward. Wait. Yami, I don't think you were supposed to be here. Am I objected? Yami stopped and turned back to her. You wanted to help people feeling bad. So let's do that. Am I looked hesitant but ceased her objection and so Yami moved forward with her slowly following him from a distance. Thirteen noticed the two children approaching them and called out to them. Hey kids. You can't wait. You're one of Midoriya's kids. Ha! Huh. Aizawa noticed Yami and looked at him confused. What are you doing here? There. Yami pointed at one of the collapsed buildings. One there. And there. And there. What's he doing? Death Arms asked. Wait, his quirk. You can see the people through the rubble, can't you? Aizawa said, recalling what he knew about Yami's quirk. Yami nodded. Aizawa paused for a moment before picking Yami up. Point out where the people are. Everyone, let's get the operation underway. Wait, eraser head, you can't seriously think of using a kid to help us? Death Arms asked him. We're low on manpower, people's lives are in danger, and he can help without putting himself in danger, Aizawa said in a rush tone. If he wants to help, I say let him. Listen to the justice hobo, Yami said. Aizawa's eyebrow twitched when a few other heroes tried to keep themselves from laughing after hearing that. Yeah, guys. The justice hobo's right. Let the kid help. Mirko snickered. We don't have much of a choice. Thirteen said. Kid, show us where they are. XXXXXXXXXXX. Izuku felt like he was going to explode from sheer frustration. Ever since he'd read Yami's note about him leaving to see the city for the day, he'd nearly fainted. Unlike many of the other kids, Yami didn't have the inherent ability to defend himself, having to rely on his grim, and he obviously didn't take any of them with him because he would have heard about it on the news by now. Yami could make a grim to defend himself if need be, but that would take a small amount of time, long enough that a villain could take advantage of it and hurt, kidnap, or kill him. So he immediately dispatched Shoji, Jiro, and Koda to find him. All three of them specializing in finding people. Still, that was only three people to cover the entire city. He wanted to send more or go out and look for him himself, but he just started walking again. He was in no condition to go on a citywide search and he still needed the others to look after the remaining children. And so all he could do right now was sitting at his desk, hoping Yami would return. Ding. That was until now. Izuka took out his phone and saw that it was a text from Naomi with a link to a video. With message under it saying lose something. Immediately Izuka pressed on it, hoping that it was information on Yami's whereabouts. 
and he was absolutely correct. Breaking news, said a newswoman from HNN, a disastrous villain attack unfolded today as Rikia Yatsubashi, a former member of the Yakuza, broke out of prison today after obtaining a dose of the drug, trigger, and went on a rampage, attacking and injuring many pro heroes before eventually being subdued by Mirko. The battle left a horrendous amount of collateral damage with people trapped under collapsed buildings and rubble and not enough heroes around to find all of them quickly enough. Fortunately, two little heroes stepped up to plate. The video then showed pictures of Amai and Yami. These two were known as Yami Midoriya and Amai Nagai. The woman identified. Midoriya's quirk involves the ability to see people's emotions even through solid objects. Nagai's quirk is called Mood Candy. It creates a candy that tastes like how she's feeling when she created them. Midoriya was used to help search for people hidden under the rubble and debris while Nagai gave all the people still conscious candy to help calm them down and brighten their moods after this horrific event. Izuku felt a surge of pride bubble up in him and a small smile came to his face. But he had to focus on the video, try and figure out where Yami was. These two assisted the heroes in their rescue before leaving to go elsewhere. But this reporter would just like to say, well done, kids. Damn it. Izuka muttered. While the video didn't tell him where Yami was at the moment, it did tell him where he was. All he had to do was figure out where this was and when it happened and he could get a good idea of the area they were in and then tell the three he sent to find him. Izuku was going to find his son. And then, well, he figured it out, but for now, he needed to find him. That was so cool, Yami. Amai gushed. The two of them had gotten hungry and decided to eat at the food court at the nearby mall and have some chicken with Yami obviously paying, although Amai did purchase a soda and a lot of candy. Yami nodded, staring at Amai's aura. It had been positively glowing with joy and it was kind of hypnotic. He'd rarely seen someone this happy. The closest he ever had seen was Kay, but even she rarely reached heights like this. Was this the power of being mentally stable? Amai meanwhile kept stuffing her face with candy and washing it down with soda and when she finished swallowing it all down she shivered and her face contorted in disgust. And Yami saw her positivity wane a tiny bit. Yami frowned. You don't like sweets? Uh. Amai shook her head. I used to, but ate them so much I don't anymore. Then why buy them? Yami said, his face scrunched up in confusion. Oh, I have to eat lots of sugar to make my candy. Amai held out her hand and opened her palm and then her hand started to glow as yellow candy came out of her hand. See. Oh. You have to eat something you not like to use quirk. Yami summarized. Like me. Hmm. Amai gave him a confused head tilt. I thought your quirk was seeing people's emotions. Yami shook his head. That's just one part. It does more. Let's me make monsters. Monsters? Amai repeated, still confused as to what exactly Yami was talking about. Yami figured it would be best to show her. So he held up his hands and let the black liquid oozing out of his mouth and into his cupped hands. Ew. Amai recoiled back in disgust a bit, seeing this supremely gross act. The small amount of black ooze pooled in his hand before changing shape and color until it hardened into a tiny grim scorpion, known as the Death Stalker. Amai leaned back in, looking at the tiny thing in awe, slowly getting closer and closer to it. Sensing that she was interested in it, Yami put the Death Stalker down on the table and commanded it to crawl towards her. The blonde poked creature, petting it gently with her finger. It's cute. Hmm, Yami grunted, not really having an opinion on it. After playing with the Death Stalker for a bit, Amai recalled what Yami had said earlier. So to make these you have to eat something you don't like too? Yami nodded. So what is it? Vegetables? Seafood? Candy? Amai guessed. Suffering, Yami answered, much to Amai's confusion. When people feel bad emotions, I eat them. So I can make these. Bad emotions? Like sadness and anger and jealousy and hate? Amai inquired curiously. Yami nodded. So, every time someone is feeling down, you get power from it. Amai summarized. Yami nodded once more, this time looking away from her and down at the floor in shame. Logically, he knew it wasn't his fault that his quirk did that but he couldn't help but feel bad about benefiting from the pain of others. I just made him feel gross inside. There was a short period of silence, and for that little bit, he was afraid that Amai would think less of him. But then she said this. You're really cool, Yami. Ha! Huh? Yami was not quite expecting that response. He looked up and Amai was just smiling at him with admiration in her eyes. Your quirk is kind of a little bit evil, to be honest. But even then you use it for good. Amai explained. You would get a lot stronger if you just let people suffer. But you didn't. You helped them instead and made yourself weaker. All for them. I, I don't really think I can be a hero. 
My quirk is weak and I'm not really too brave. But I think people like heroes who put others over themselves, I think those people are the coolest. And you're like them. I'm like, a hero? Yami suddenly recalled his conversation with Fu. A quirk is only evil if you use it to be evil. Your quirk doesn't make people suffer. It takes their suffering and uses it to make grim. If you use your grim to help people, then you're just taking something bad and making something good out of it. He didn't fully understand what to do with at the time. At the time, he just thought it meant he should keep trying his best to help Zuku, but perhaps he could do more than that. Looking back at that situation, there was a lot he could have done if he was allowed. He could have taken down that villain, then made more grim to rescue everyone, and done all of that himself. What kind of good could he do with an army of diverse creatures who could, in theory, be tailored made for certain situations? But what about the mental pain? Could he help with that? Well, he could see people's emotions, maybe he could help people with that in some way. Are you done eating Midoriya? Amai asked. I want to give out some more candies before it gets dark. Yami snapped out of his thoughts and nodded with the two throwing their trash before taking their leave. Once the two of them left the mall, they went to a variety of places. A homeless shelter, a graveyard, and various other locations where sad or scared people went. After finishing up at their last location, they noticed the sun starting to set. We should get back home, Amai said. It's going to get dark soon. Yami nodded. He figured that he should start going back home as well before Azuka got even more worried than he already was. But then he noticed something, something close by. A shroud of negativity. Nowhere near as intense as the geysers. But it was still pretty bad. One more. Over there. Yami said, pointing to a playground that was very close by. Oh? Someone's feeling bad over there. Amai asked. Well, I guess we can do just one more. Yami nodded and the two made their way to the playground. When they got there, they found two boys, maybe a little older than the two of them, but not by much. One smaller boy on his knees with an action figure of hawks in front of him. He was crying, and he also had some bruises and first on him. And one larger boy, looking down at the boy with a cruel smirk. He was rather beefy for his age, most likely because of his quirk. The larger boy raised his foot and crushed the action figure. No. Hawks. The smaller boy cried out in anguish, tears streaming down his face. Look at you. Crying over a bit of plastic. Pathetic. The larger boy laughed. Amai gasped at the bullying she saw in front of her while Yami squinted, observing their emotions. The smaller boy was obviously filled with fear and sadness as well as a bit of rage. But the larger one was filled with joy, taking delight in causing pain to the helpless child in front of him. Just like that villain from earlier. The larger boy started getting closer to the smaller, one looking like he was about to start getting violent, and that's when Yami decided to step in. Rag who? Yami let out an animal-like growl, getting everyone's attention and shocking them. While the larger boy was recovering from his shock, Yami used that tie to step between the two boys, glaring at the older boy, seeing fear overtake him. Why? Yami barked. H huh. The boy stumbled back in fear. Why do this? Yami asked aggressively. Why? What the heck are you talking about? The boy asked, getting aggressive again, trying to stand his ground, but it was obvious he was still terrified. Hey, get out of here. Amai decided now was the time to step in, getting behind Yami and glaring at the larger boy. It's almost nighttime. Don't you have to go home? The boy's eyes widened and he stayed silent for a minute before scowling at them. F fine. Have fun, losers. And with that, the boy turned around, hesitating for a moment before walking off slowly. With the boy leaving, Amai turned her attention to the smaller boy. Are you all right? The boy was about to speak when Yami turned around and the boy say his face. H. Ahi. Suddenly the smaller boy ran away in terror, fleeing before either of them could even say anything. He left before I could give him a candy. Amai pouted with disappointment. Yami on the other hand looked back towards the larger boy who would soon be out of sight. Following, Yami said as he started walking towards the bully. Huh? Following who? Amai said, walking along with Yami. That bully? Why? He's scared. Very scared. Yami answered with a bit of worry painting his normally stoic expression. Well, you are a bit scary to look at, Amai admitted, feeling terrible about having said that despite it being true. No, not scared of me. Yami explained. When told to go home, he got more scared. A lot more scared. He's scared of home. Amai looked at the bully with both confusion and concern. Why is he scared of going home? Yami didn't answer. It didn't take them long to reach the bully's home. It was a small house with not much of note about it. Completely unassuming. 
Yami and Amai were hiding in a nearby bush, watching the bully enter the house, seemingly as slowly as possible. What are you seeing? Amai asked. MMMM. Yami took a hard look at the house, seeing the people's auras from inside their home. Three people. Two adults. One woman. One man. And the boy. Woman and boy are scared. Very scared. And the man is angry. He sees the boy, he's even angrier, and the boy is more scared. He's getting close to the boy. Suddenly, the two felt a hand on their shoulders. EAP. Amai jumped. Ra. Yami's first instinct was to bite whoever this was, and luckily the person withdrew their hand fast enough so they didn't get bit. Hey, hey. The person who turned out to be Jiro said. You don't bite people, kid. Jeez. It's you. Yami said, recognizing her. Weird your lady. Weird your lady. Jiro said, taking offense to that. It's Jiro. Don't start giving me weird nicknames, kid. Um, you know this person? Amai asked. Yami nodded. She's a Yui student. She works for dad. For now. Jiro corrected before giving Yami a stern look. Speaking of your dad, you almost gave him a heart attack. Jiro suddenly trailed off as it seemed like something else had attracted her attention and she looked up at the bully's house. A moment passed before Jiro took a step closer and raised her earphone jacks up towards the house. After a couple of minutes passed, she looked back at the two children. You two stay here, I have to make some calls. The sun had finished setting and day had turned to night by the time the police arrived. Yami and Amai watched alongside Jiro as a man, presumably the young boy's father, was taken out of the house in handcuffs struggling against the police that were holding him to no avail and cursing loudly at everyone. WH what happened? Why is he being arrested? Amai asked, looking distraught and confused. Oh well. Jiro winced as she tried to find a way to say this. He was hurting his son, Yami said, beating her to it. Child abuse? See child abuse? Amai didn't seem to fully understand what that was, but she grasped a part of it and that part horrified her. It's okay. He's gone now. Jiro quickly reassured her, not wanting to deal with a crying kid right now. He's can't hurt anyone anymore. Amai didn't say a word, just looking at the boy and his mother at the doorway as they watched their abuser get taken away. After the incident with the police was done, it was finally time for the kids to start getting home. Starting with Amai. After a bit of a walk, they reached the blonde girl's house. It was pretty sizable. Not too big, but decently large. The home of a well-off family. Once they reached the front yard, that's when they decided to say their goodbyes. Amai gave Yami and Jiro a polite bow. Thank you for everything, Midoriya. Today was good? Well, we helped a lot of people, so it has to be good. Right? H&N. Yami nodded. Good. Yeah. It was good. Amai said more confidently. Oh. I want to give you this. Amai then took a small card out of her bag and presented it to Yami who took it and gave it a glance. The card was handwritten in colored pencil. With the words let's be friends with smiley faces on the sides. And Bello that was a phone number, presumable hers. Cute. Jiro thought, giving a small smirk. That's my phone number so um, you can call it if you want to see me or talk to me again. Amai said, looking at Yami with hopeful eyes. Hmm. Thank you. Yami put the card in his pocket. Frind. A radiant smile broke out on Amai's face as joy and excitement filled her at that response and she skipped back over to her front door. Jiro and Yami turned away and started their trip back to the house. Well, looks like you've had a busy day. Hope it was worth it. Jiro said. Hmm. Yami still had some things he needed to figure out but he was absolutely sure that his trip had been worth it. Do you have any idea how worried I was? Izuka said, not quite shouting but speaking very loudly. After getting back home, Yami was immediately met by Izuku at the gates, who rushed him into his office so they could speak. You really should have told us about this, honey. It's not good for your father's health for him to wake up with a child missing. Inko was also there, wanting to make sure things went smoothly. Sorry. Yami actually did feel a bit guilty here, not realizing that this might have negatively affected Izuku's health. I mean, why would you even do that? Izuku asked, leaning on his desk to help keep him upright. I needed to understand people, Yami answered. Can't do that here. This place is different. Izuku's expression softened as he took in what his son said. It's not like he didn't realize what brought this on. He remembered yesterday's conversation very well. Yami had seen a glimpse of a cruel world and needed to see more. And from what he'd heard on the news and from Jiro's report, he'd seen it. Izuku sighed. Look, I get it. You can't really see the world from here. But next time, just ask and go with a guide. It's safer that way. Yami nodded. Dad, 
That boy, who was being abused. He was bullying another boy and he was enjoying it. Why? He should know it was bad because it happened to him. But he did it. Why? Izuka paused, going around his desk and taking a seat. Okay, well, I guess it was probably about control. Control? Yami repeated in confusion. Izuka nodded. That boy didn't know how to process what was happening to him. He felt so helpless and powerless. So when he was bullying that boy, he felt in control. Like he had power. It made him feel better for just a little bit. But it wasn't going to fix anything and in the end, it just made someone else feel bad. So, if he had therapy, he wouldn't do that? Yami asked. I mean, if you got him away from that father of his, then probably, Izuka answered. Yami didn't respond, instead just sitting there thinking. After realizing that Yami wasn't going to continue, Izuka spoke. Well, you did do a lot of good out there. And I am at fault for not establishing rules about going into the city. So I'm not going to be too harsh on you. No desert tomorrow and you're not allowed to go back into the city for three days. Yami had a slight pout, not happy about missing desert, but nodded, accepting his punishment without argument. Now with that decided, Izuka looked down at his son. What did you learn out there? I learned what I want to do. Yami looked Izuku in the eyes. I want to help people who are suffering. I want to be a hero and a therapist. To make people happy. Izuka smiled at that response. Well then, as your father, I will do everything in my power to support you. I know, Yami said. Thank you, I love you, dad. HNGH. Izuku felt his heart clench and his face scrunched up becoming not so appealing to look at. Dad. Yami became concerned that something was wrong but was confused by the extremely happy aura around Izuku. Don't be scared, dear, that's just something that happens to your father when he gets really happy, Inko reassured him, taking Yami by the shoulder and guiding him out of the room. Now let's give your father some time to relax, all this excitement today is not good for his health. Okay. Good night, dad. Yami said. Gee, good night, son. Izuka smiled, recovering from the rush of joy he just felt a moment ago. And with that, Yami and Inko exited the room. Grandma? Yami said, looking up at Inko as they walked. Wanna go one more place before bed? Eri was just getting ready for bed, she'd already gotten in her pajamas and was just about to climb into her bed when suddenly she was interrupted. Knock, knock, knock. Huh? Eri looked at the door, confused. Who would be knocking on her door at this hour? Kay? This wouldn't be the first time she sprung a late-night slumber party on her. Kiba? She was typically active at night. She opened the door, and much to her surprise, it was Yami. Why off? Eri was shocked by Yami suddenly hugging her. Completely out of nowhere. Ha! Huh, you're a good child. And we all love you. Yami told her. Ehui! Eri's face broke out into a flustered blush as she was not ready to be assaulted by praise from Yami of all people. T thank you. Hmm. Yami took a good look at Eri. She had been through so much and had likely been like one of those people with the negativity geysers out there. And now here she was. Happy if quite embarrassed. The same could be said for almost all children in this house. They could have very well ended up like the people out there. His father had done so much and would continue to do so much for even more children. And soon it would be his turn to make people happy. Fu was always rather good at noticing things, picking up on things that others didn't. Whether it was people's facial expressions, the looks in their eyes, their body language. This also applied to just noticing things about his surroundings. And that's how he got into this situation. Fu had been just swinging around the forest with Kyosei, practicing his agility skills so that he would be a better hero in the future. All right, that's 20 swings from 19 trees without falling. Doing good so far, Kyosei. Fu thought as he took a break, his hands forming claws that allowing him to stay on the side of the tree. He felt Kyosei's appreciation and a bit of smugness. Fu rolled his eyes. Don't get overconfident we could still. I, Lo. Fu froze as he could suddenly faintly hear a young girl's voice. And no one he was familiar with. Now for the most part, people didn't just stumble their way towards their house by accident. Mostly because they lived in a forest filled to the brim with Grim guarding it. So for someone to be this close without Izuku being alerted was suspicious. And so that's what led Fu to seek out the source. Using Kyosei's tendrils, he moved from tree to tree as silently as he could, getting closer to the voice. And eventually, he found its source. A small girl looking to be about eight years old. She had long pink hair and donned a simple red dress. What's more, on top of her head are what at first glance looked like cat ears, but were actually some type of horn. She was speaking into what seemed like an earpiece, which made Fu even more suspicious of her. They won't know anything. 
were the last words she said before suddenly the earpiece floated out of her ear and was crushed by an invisible force. Yup, she is definitely suspicious. Fu thought while looking down on her as she started walking towards the direction of the house. I can't let someone like this enter the house just yet. Too dangerous. I need to figure out what she wants. Still, Fu understood the importance of subtlety so he waited a minute following silently behind her. After a bit of time had passed, he figured it was time to greet their guest. Fu used Kyosei's tendrils to lower himself down from the tree and onto the ground a few feet behind the girl. Hey! Fu greeted. The girl jumped slightly and quickly turned around to face him. H hello? Please don't sneak up on me like that. You'll scare me to death. She put her hand on her chest and she looked like she had almost been shot or something. And her voice was so timid and frail. In other words, she was overacting. Back when Kiba and him were on the streets, acting overly frail or weak was a good way to gain sympathy or misdirect and trick someone. Especially compared to how she sounded earlier when she spoke in that airpiece. Back there she sounded cold and serious. Everything about her current self seemed fake. Sorry, I didn't mean to startle you. Fu apologized. I just wanted to know what you were doing here. Oh, um, my name is Nis. The girl shuffled her feet nervously in an extremely cute manner. Too cute. Um, my mommy and daddy said that my quirk makes me a demon. And so they told me to go where all the other demons are. Hey, and I heard that was here. Oh? And what exactly is your quirk? Fu asked her. And my quirk? Nis nee stuttered. I it makes me explode if I get too nervous, oh or scared. I'm sorry if I'm rude but this place is scary. See can we go to the house? Please. Interesting. Then how did you do that thing with the earpiece earlier? Fu asked sarcastically, poking a huge hole in her story. Nisa's eyes widened and she took a step back in shock. Also, if your parents abandoned you, who were you talking to in your earpiece? Fu asked, continuing to poke holes in her story. A second later, Nis, if that was her real name, gave him a fierce scowl, showing her true self, with an expression that did not belong on a child full of murderous intent. Slice. And then Fu's head flew off. Out of nowhere, suddenly Fu's neck was sliced through and his head flew up into the air, his neck and now dismembered head spilling blood all over the ground. TCH, damn it, now I have to hide this. Nis grit her teeth in annoyance, as if she had just spilled something on her clothes and not taken a life. Or tried to anyway. Before Nis could do anything, two tendrils came out of Fu's body, one from his neck that caught his head and brought it down to his body, and another that shot out of his chest and smacked Nis into a tree a few feet away holding her there. Ack! W what? Nis hissed out in pain and confusion, wondering what exactly was happening here. Yeah, definitely a good thing I didn't let you get close to the house, Fu said after reattaching his head. Grrrrrrrr. Nis growled as suddenly Kyosei's tendril was cut into pieces, freeing the pink-haired demon child. How the fuck are you still alive? Firstly, language, Fu said as Kaisoei started to overtake his body. Shifting into battle mode. Secondly, you said it yourself. You were looking for the place where the demons lived. Well, you found it. Once Fu had been completely covered in Kyosei's black armor goop, he sent out four tendrils from his back at Nis, hoping to ensnare her limbs. However, those tendrils didn't make it more than a few feet towards Nis before they were suddenly cut to ribbons by an invisible force. Looks like she has some kind of invisible telepathic blade or something. Fu analyzed. Suddenly, Nis was catapulted at him by the same invisible force and when she was only a few feet away, she suddenly stopped midair, just floating there, or rather it looked like she was been held up by something. And then Fu felt something like a weird invisible hand go through his chest and pull out his heart. No, not a blade. Maybe a hand? Fu theorized and he made his hand grow to the size of his body and tried to hit knees in a grand sweeping motion. However, when the swipe was about two and a half feet away from Nisa's body, it was suddenly was stopped by that invisible force again. But that was Fu's plan as suddenly the black symbiote goo started spreading onto whatever it was that was stopping it, making it visible. It was a hand. A hand connected to a long tendril that judging from what Fu could see of it was coming out of her back. Grr. Off. Nis growled, and suddenly the tendril and hand disappeared, causing the part of the symbiote that was coving it to get sucked back into Fu's hand, but then suddenly the hand was cut into pieces. Just die already. Slice. 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 Crunch. Nis fell to the ground, and a second later, Fu's limbs and head were sliced off, his body was cut in two, and his skull was smashed into the ground like a pumpkin, spilling blood of viscera all over the place. Nis breathed a sigh of relief, thinking she finally killed him. But it didn't last long. 
Kyosei brought all of Fu's parts together and helped along with Fu's natural regeneration to put him back together in a matter of seconds. That's not gonna work, Fu said as he finished regrowing everything. What are you immortal? Nis shouted out in frustration and slight fear. Pretty much. Of course, both Fu and Kyosei had ways to negate their regeneration and eventually kill them, but she didn't need to know that. A very interesting quirk you have there. Let's see. From what I could figure out it lets you create invisible hands that come out of your back, which can cut and crush opponents from a medium distance. But when I tried wrapping it up it vanished. Can it turn intangible or can it only exist for a short period of time? Nis did not seem amused. GRRRR. Die. Suddenly Fu was picked up by the invisible arms and then slammed into the ground where he was then clobbered by a barrage of extremely quick punches that turned his body to a bloody paste. This still failed to kill him, however, and Kyosei wrapped around the arms that were punching him, halting them for a bit and allowing Fu to finally see them all. Four. There were a total of four. Okay, good to know. Fu thought. The arms vanished from Kyosei's grasp before quickly going back to pummeling Fu's regenerating body. So she can make them vanish on command. All right. Fu was gathering more and more info. All while planning a counterattack. Because while she was beating him into the dirt, Fu sent a special surprise under him. Suddenly, a big black tendril came out of the ground, having tunneled up behind Nis. Before the girl could react, the tendril smacked her into a tree hard. Gah! Nis felt the wind get knocked out of her as her back hit the tree so hard it made a crack in the wood. Quickly, Fu recalled the tendril back into himself as he started to regenerate his body back to pristine condition. It's a really good thing I can't feel pain. Fu thought as he jumped back, using his tendrils to make some lines in the dirt as he leapt away. Good. Once again Nis growled and moved forward to attack Fu who was now much farther. Once she reached the first line Fu drew, Fu sent out five tendrils towards her. She cut them up once they got closer to her. But little did she know this was part of Fu's plan. Each one of those lines represented a foot of length, meaning he got to roughly measure how long her invisible hand tendril things were. Roughly six feet was her effective range it seemed, Fu sent a few more tendrils at her to confirm and that seemed to be accurate. So she had four arms with a range of six feet. She could make them intangible, they were very strong and they moved very very fast. He couldn't afford to throw himself recklessly at her, otherwise he'd use up all his meat reserves and die. Fu had to fight smarter, not harder. But while Fu couldn't throw himself at her, Kyosei could. So long as there was no fire or sonic attacks, nothing could really hurt him. And she only had four of her arm things and could only reach six feet. Kyosei could do much, much more. Fu mustered up as many tendrils as he could, around twenty in total, and launched them at knees from as many angles as he could, as quickly as he could. Knees grits her teeth and braced herself. The tendrils came at her quickly and furiously and Nis did the best she could to cut them to ribbons, but each time she cut one another one would come, she would cut that one, and the one she just cut would grow back and come back at her. They kept getting closer and closer to her, inching forward towards her as she struggled to keep cutting them up. If this kept up they would reach her eventually. She had move. Nis used her invisible arms to launch herself up into the trees, having one of her arms grab and dig into the tree trunk, making it seem like she was floating in the air. Fu sent the tendrils after her and Nis had to jump from tree to tree, quickly getting away from the tendrils and launching herself towards Fu. Fu sent out a tendril behind him to grapple himself away from her range, but she was quick and as he was getting away, she got close enough and sliced him in two. She's fast. Fu thought as the tendril dragged his now legless body away from her. He doesn't even need to reattach his parts to heal. Nis growled as she watched Fu quickly start to grow back his legs. Nis then started to chase after him, with Fu swinging away as the two swung through the trees of the dense forest. She's faster than me, need to slow her down. Fu thought. Fu sent out tendrils all around him, grabbing branches off trees and throwing them at Nis. Nis tossed them aside with ease, but this did slow her down just a little bit. Fu then started to make some hard turns, making it even harder for her to follow him. And eventually, Nis lost sight of him. The pink-haired girl looked around frantically, trying to figure out where he had gone. No. 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 Damn him why won't he just die? She looked down at the ground beneath her as emotions began to boil up. Shame, anger, fear? No. I won't fail. Not again. I can't fail again. And it when then as she looked down she noticed something. A shadow looming over her getting bigger and bigger. Her eyes widened and she looked up to see Fu lunging at her from the sky. He was less than three feet away from her. She couldn't move away. 
Not in time to avoid an attack from the monster bearing down at her. She had to use one of her invisible arms to keep her up and from this distance, she wasn't sure if she could cut him up fast enough with just three. So she made a decision. He shot herself downwards towards the floor, getting some distance on Fu and allowing her to use all her arms to slice Fu to pieces. Slice. 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 Crack. Fu's body was cut into many, many pieces and both of them fell on the floor, knees hitting her back on the hard dirt ground. Ahoy! The young girl screamed out in pain as blood started coming out of her mouth, the impact doing serious damage to her small body. Fu's chunks and Kyosi eyes goo fell around her as she used her quirk to make sure nothing fell on her except for the blood that came raining down. Knees lied on the floor for a minute, trying to recover from her injuries and desperately hoping that Fu was actually dead. Unfortunately for her, it was not to be as Kyosi eyes black goop started moving, gathering all of Fu's pieces in a ball of ooze. Inside the ball, Fu quickly regenerated and the ball morphed back into Fu's form as in about a minute Fu was back, good as new, at least on the outside. Internally, Fu had used up a little more than half his meat reserves, which was not good, to say the least. But she didn't know that. All that she saw was that she cut him into chunks and he was still alive and perfectly fine. While she was on the ground, very injured and running out of energy. To her, she was losing this fight and then some. But Fu knew this fight was far more even. If he wasn't able to regenerate, then he would die pretty quickly. Not to mention he would go into his rampage mode, meaning he wouldn't even be able to retreat. He'd turn into a mindless animal that would soon be slaughtered. But she didn't know that. And he could see the fear in angry red eyes. Maybe, just maybe, he could end the fight right here, and if not at least he could find out a bit more from her. Fu took a few steps back as Nis lifted herself up with her quirk and allowed Kyosi to retreat back into his body, revealing his normal form once more. Is this really worth it? Throwing yourself at an opponent you can't beat for what? Why did you even come here? Fu asked her. It's none of your business. Ni spat at him, setting herself down on the ground. I'll kill you. Every quirk has a weakness. I'll find yours and I'll kill you. I can't fail. I won't. If that's true, then what about your weakness? Wouldn't overusing those arm things of yours do something bad to you? Fu asked her. Jirarar. They're called vectors. Ni nee said through clenched teeth. Judging from her reaction, overuse is a serious problem for her. Fu thought. Well, you're right about one thing. I have a weakness. But it's not something you can use. No matter how many times you use those vectors of yours, I'll just heal back up. You can't win this fight. So, what are you even trying for? Why put yourself through all this? I, I can't fail. The girl repeated, looking at the ground with teeth gritted so tightly it's a wonder they didn't break, and her fist clenched so hard that her nails started to dig through her skin. Mommy and Daddy said I had to kill him. I have to. Otherwise, I'm worthless. And they'll put me in the training room again. I'm not going back. I can't go back. I won't. You don't have to, Fu told her. Huh? What? Nis looked up at him, confused and angry, wondering what the hell he could be blathering on about. You don't have to go back to them, Fu said. It seems like you're one of us. The ones who go unlucky at birth. Most of our parents didn't love us either. My parents love me. The girl shouted back furiously. As long as I do what I'm told and kill who they tell me to, they'll love me. Parents whose love you have to earn aren't real parents. Fu countered. My father loves me and every single one of my siblings just for being us. Even when we mess up and make him mad or upset by doing something bad, he doesn't stop loving us or whatever it is that your parents do to you that's making react like that. And he'd never make us do something like taking lives. Shut up. Nis whispered, lowering her head, hiding her face from sight. Do you really want to live like that? Fu asked her, raising his voice. A slave to your parents. Working for love that they'll stop giving you if you mess up once? Is that really what you want to do with the rest of your life? Shut up. Nis shouted out in pure rage and Fu expected her to charge at him again and quickly made Kyosi go back over his body. But instead, her horns grew, tripling in length. Fu's eyes widened as he had a bad feeling about what was about to happen next. Splat! And he was proven right a second later, as, despite being far out of her range, Fu felt her vectors fly into his body and tear him in two. And then in four, and then in eight, and more and more, until he was just a red mush and meat chunks on the ground. But Nis didn't stop, in a rage, she used her vectors to smash Fu's remains into the dirt, making a crater that got larger and larger with each strike. Smash! Smash! Smash. Smash. The more she smashed up Fu's body, the more her own began to wear down as her quirk started taking its toll on her. 
Blood started pouring from her mouth and her eyes and cuts started appearing all over her body. She could feel her bones start to shake and her head hurt so much she felt like she was dying. It was only when the pain became unbearable did she stop. Her horns shrank back into her head and her vectors shrunk down to their normal length. Knees looked at Fu's remains which at this point was nothing but a bunch of red liquid on the ground. She waited, wondering if Fu would start regenerating. He didn't. Fu's remains stayed there, unmoving and completely lifeless. After a couple of minutes passed, Knees fell on her knees and took deep breaths. Finally, the fight was over. She killed him. So why wasn't she happy? It hurt so much. She was in so much pain. But the mission wasn't over. She still had much more to do. And because of this, it would only be so much harder. And her parents wouldn't care how hard she tried. How much pain she endured for them. How much she bled for them. If she failed, then all of this would be meaningless and she would go back to being tortured in that training room again. Do you really want to live like that? A slave to your parents? Working for love that they'll stop giving you if you mess up once? Is that really what you want to do with the rest of your life? As Fu's words went through her head, Niza's body felt even weaker. She felt sick as a terrible feeling of fear, dread, and sadness permeated her body and tears flowed freely from her eyes. Was this all her life had in store? Pain and blood. All this pain, all this death for love that she'd never really be able to keep? Parents whose love you have to earn aren't real parents. My father loves me and every single one of my siblings just for being us. Even when we mess up and make him mad or upset by doing something bad, he doesn't stop loving us or whatever it is that your parents do to you that's making react like that. And he'd never make us do something like taking lives. God, that sounded so nice. Too good to be true. It had to be some kind of lie. Because a life like that couldn't exist. All things had their purpose, all people had their purpose. They had jobs they needed to do in order to earn what they wanted. And hers was to kill the people that made her parents' lives harder. That was what she was bred for, what her quirk was made for. To be loved for just existing was impossible, but it sounded so nice. How many times had she put on the persona of a sweet, dumb, innocent child? It always lowered people's guards. Because it was cute. People thought she was cute. How badly did she wish she was actually that cute, innocent, dumb, sweet girl? That she wasn't born with a quirk only made for taking lives. For a moment, she allowed herself a fantasy. A fantasy of a world where she was that sweet girl and her parents were like how Fu described his father to be. No more assassinations, no more training, no more blood. Just love, smiles, happiness, and warmth. She felt a bit of warmth growing in her chest that quickly tightened up and became painful. Because as nice as that fantasy was, it was just that. A fantasy. And now it was time to stop fantasizing and get back to war. Snap. Suddenly knees heard a twig snap right behind her. She quickly turned her head and saw Fu about a foot away from her, his hand formed into a blade, ready to strike. In that instant, they both reacted. Niza's vectors shoved Fu away as hard as she could, but not before he could get in a single strike. Chop. Smash. Fu hit hard enough to crack it almost all the way through, despite it being a rather large and thick tree. And Niz saw her right horn fall to the ground as it had been chopped off her head. No. Niz picked up her fallen horn, looking at it with eyes full of shock and horror. After seeing how your horns grew when you powered up, I figured they were more important than I thought. Fu said, making note of the thick tree behind him before turning back to his opponent. And judging by your reaction, I'm guessing I was right. Ni nee spent a few more seconds mourning the loss of her horn before her face contorted into an enraged snarl and she stood back up and turned to look at Fu. How are you still alive? I turned your whole body into juice. Not my whole body. Just most of it. Fu corrected. You see, the moment I realized you powered up and felt your vector start to tear my body apart, I used Kyosei to cut my head off and then had him roll it away where I could regenerate. And you were distracted by your own rage that you didn't notice a thing. Damn you. Damn you. Yi shouted out in fury. I gave you a chance. Now we do this the hard way. Fu then spun around, using his blade hand to cut the already mostly cut tree that he had been hit into before dashing off to the right. Yi was about to do something to attack him when she heard the sound of the tree falling. And it was about to fall on top of her. The pinquette grit her teeth and readied her vectors. Her right horn had been cut off, meaning she only had the two vectors remaining on the left side of her body. When the tree came down on her, she sliced it to pieces. And while that saved her from most of the danger, with only two vectors, she could only protect herself so much. So when the smaller chunks she cut up started to rain down, she couldn't stop them all, and one of them hit her right in the face. Ah! Nice cried as pain washed over her, and she shut her eyes. 
Fu took advantage of this and sent out a powerful tendril at top speed, right at knees. The girl could do nothing as the tendril slammed into her and then slammed her into a tree. Crack! Her head hit the tree hard, causing her skull to crack and blood to come out. Knees immediately lost consciousness as her body went limp on Fu's tendril. Fu, feeling her go limp, concluded that she was no longer able to fight. Still just to be safe, a smaller tendril split off from the larger one and went up to Niza's other horn. Snap! With both horns broken, Fu felt it was safe to say he won. So, what the heck happened, Naomi? Izuku asked over the phone. Izuku was currently sitting in his office and he was not happy. Achiko, Fu, and Inko were also present and none of them looked partially happy either. It had been a few hours since Fu's fight with Niz and it had been hectic. The girl had been taken away, placed in restraints, and sent to the hospital to be treated for all the injuries she sustained from the battle. Now Izuku and company were left with the aftermath. Honestly, I have no idea, Naomi told him. No, no does. We've been looking into it the moment you reported it, but we have no clue why what happened happened. Someone sent a child assassin here, probably to kill someone, probably me, and ended up fighting one of my children to the death. Almost killing Fu and themselves in the process. And you have no idea who sent them or why. Izuka shouted into the phone. Hey, man, don't take it out on me. It's not my fault. Naomi told him. And it's not like we can't find it because we've been slacking off. DC isn't even handling the investigation. There is no record of this girl anywhere. And we already put her through a blood test, but we can't find any damn results. Whoever sent this kid must be serious business, which actually if you think about this makes it even more fucked up because you have all those resources to do crap like this and you still send a child to kill someone. Really screwed up, man. Naomi. Not helping. Izuka screamed. Right, right, sorry, Naomi said. Of of curiosity, are you more upset about the child assassin thing, the almost killing your son thing, or the possible attempt on your life thing? Yes. Izuku was now so angry that you could see the veins popped out of his head. Got it. Fair enough. Naomi said. Anyway, we'll keep you posted about this situation and on the topic of security. Well, you're hiring help anyway, so you should probably hire some security as well. Anyway, see ya. And then she hung up. Izuka grit his teeth and slammed his phone into the desk. He took a few deep breaths to try and expel the anger so he could have a clear mind again. But it was difficult with how pissed of he was at the moment. Someone sent a child. A child. No older than any of his own to come here and kill him. And in the process his own son was nearly killed. Everything about this situation made his blood boil. Both Inko and Achiko put their hands on his back, trying to soothe him and helping a little bit. Izuku quickly went into his drawer, opened it up and pulled out a beige candy bar. This was a gift from Amai. After hearing from Yami about how stressed Izuka could get, she made him this calm candy to help soothe his nerves. Izuka took a big chomp out of the bar and instantly felt a lot of the anger melt away as the calming effect of the candy took hold. After taking a few more bites of it, his anger was subdued. Not dissipated, but subdued for now. Izuka looked up at Fu, who was staring at him from the other side of the desk waiting to be addressed. Fu, when you were being attacked, why didn't you call for help? Izuka asked him sternly but calmly. The side effect of the mood candies is that if you ate too much in one sitting, you'd be stuck in that mood for a while. So most of Izuka's emotions right now were being subdued by the candy. I didn't want anyone else to get hurt, Fu explained. That girl was too dangerous. If the 1A students or almost anyone else came, they would have died. So I lured her away from the house and away from the seers. But Fu, we have Grim. We could have just surrounded her with those until we could capture her. Izuka pointed out. You didn't need to risk yourself like that. Honestly, Dad, I was just caught up in the fight, Fu explained. I was so focused on beating her and keeping her away from everyone else that I didn't even think about the Grim. You got caught up in the fight. Izuka took a moment to ponder that. That seems unlike you. It is. Normally that wouldn't happen. But she was too strong. I needed to pay full attention to her. Otherwise, I would have died. Fu explained. But there was also something else. I wanted to find out more about her because some things didn't make sense about her. She didn't know about my regeneration's limits, so to her, I must have seemed unkillable. She was smart and trained too, so she should have known when to give up and retreated at some point, but she never did. She was desperate and afraid of something. And I wanted to find out what it was. I see, so on top of saving us, you wanted to save her as well. Izuka surmised. There was a bit of a pause before he got up and went around his desk, before kneeling down and bringing his sons into a bear hug. I'm so proud of both of you, Izuka told them. You and Kyosei. 
Kaiosei oozed out a fu and wrapped around Izuku wanting to get in on the affection. You both protected your family against a very dangerous foe. Thank you both, Izuka said. That being said, you put both yourself and Kaiosei in danger. Remember, Kaiosei is your baby brother and depends on you to live properly. When you risk your life, you risk his as well. Fu's eyes widened a bit. That was a fantastic point that Fu hadn't thought about at all. Being bonded to Fu was rather hard to describe. He was aware that Kaiosei was a separate being but at the same time, he wasn't. Fu most of the time tended to think of Kaiosei like his own sentient quirk rather than a separate person or the baby that he actually was. It was part of the bonding process. It was natural to think of them as one being. But they weren't. Kaiosei was a baby, he was gonna do whatever Fu wanted him to do because Fu was his host. He needed him. He didn't really have much of a choice but to go along with Fu. Fu actually felt a bit bad about that part in particular. He didn't mind risking his own life for his family, but Kaiosei was another matter. Sorry, Dad, Kaiosei. Fu apologized. Kaiosei felt confused but accepted it regardless. I'll accept whatever punishment you have for me, Fu said, bowing his head in acceptance of whatever came next. Izuka sighed and shook his head. Given the circumstances, I can't fully fault you for what happened. And you definitely did far more good than bad. With that in mind, I think you almost dying is enough of a punishment. Achiko, can you take Fu and preparing a feast for him? I can only imagine how much of your reserves you used. A lot. Thanks, Dad. Fu gave Izuku a rare smile, which Izuka happily returned as Achiko guided him out of the room. The least I can do for my little hero, Izuka said. Fu felt a twinge of embarrassment as he was taken out of the room and towards the kitchen. Once Fu left, Izuka leaned back in his seat and sighed. I'll have to ask Yami to make more sears and more grim. I can't have this happen again. He reminds me so much of you. Inko smiled, recalling Fu's explanation. Yes, reckless. Like me. Izuka lamented. First Yami and now him? These kids are gonna kill me and not in the anyone thought they would have. Now you know how I felt every time you decided to get a closer look at a hero fight. Inko giggled. Well, I would say you have it harder. I think so too, Izuka said. It's worth it though. Still, on top of increasing security, I also have to figure out why she came here in the first place. I would also be interesting to know what kind of sick person would send a child to kill someone, Inko said, a look of disgust. Oh, don't worry, mom. When I find out who did this dash, Izuku felt his anger bubble up, overpowering the candy. I'll do what's within my power to make sure they pay. And that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed. If you did, please like, subscribe, share the video, and support the original writer. See you in the next video.